This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome on board to some very blue skies here in Juma Private Game Reserve. It's a beautiful afternoon out and about. Hello, everybody. Welcome on board. It is really nice to be out in the heat of the day. Um, and it's not only myself out. We've also got um, Sharla, who will be joining us shortly with Mpo. We've got Swaluk Kalahari, where Kyle and BK will be out. We've got Kim and Craig out in Ambient Pinda. And Yapi and Khat in Ngala. And we do welcome you all on board your live African safari. <laughs> Welcome aboard, welcome to Juma, and it is a wonderful afternoon with a little bit of a breeze. It is about 32 degrees Celsius, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. My name is Steve, and I'm joined by Johan on camera, and we are always, as always, excited to have you with us. Our plans for the afternoon is we're going to be heading up to Bufusuk to see what we can find. Um, it's nice to go and just explore an area I haven't been into for some time. And if you have any questions or comments, please send them through to hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter. Throw them in the YouTube chat stream. And as always, you can go to the website and send them through on the live Safari page. If you are under the age of 18, get your parents or guardians to send your questions through at kidsquestions at wildearth.tv. On that note, though, we're going to start moving as it's getting quite warm in the sunshine here. We're heading on Gallego Shortcut up towards Bifosuk which is in a sort of northerly direction. And who knows what we might find. I just heard some elephants making a big noise over there. They might be at Tamburti Dam. So let's go straight there, first of all, because uh, elephants this time of day are always the best to spend time with. We might go and do a little bit of a, a water point survey of Bufusuk and see how the water is faring on that side. As the last two days, today is day three of the Burpees for Conservation Challenge. If you're interested, go and check out hashtag Burpees for Conservation. You can also check that out as well on YouTube and see Bruce in action doing his burpees. He's raising a million rand for conservation and for protection of our love species. So I've managed to do another 100 burpees today, 300 in. I'm aiming to do a thousand. So far, only 700 to go. But I felt quite good today. I woke up this morning and I did 25 before coffee, which I thought was a bad idea, but it really uh, leveled things out. I did 25 more before breakfast and then an easy 50. I actually almost felt like I could have done some more, but I've just got to bear in mind that I've got another 700 to do. So let's see how we feel tomorrow. The body is feeling quite good. And uh, people are really jumping on board from across the country, across the world, donating. We do thank all of those of you who have been donating and those who are registering and adding in your burpees. Even seen some videos of some very small children doing their versions of burpees, which is wonderful. For such a good cause. Well, it is a blue sky today with some clouds, but let's go see what it's looking like weather-wise elsewhere. Celsius, as you saw, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and it is warm. So, Steve and I, 
Shala with a four on camera, where we both have a similar plan. We're going to be looking at water holes, at least for the first hour or so of show when it's still very, very warm. At this time of the day, you get lots of birds at water holes. Early in the morning, not so much, but when it's really hot, it's great birding to sit at a water hole for a little bit. So we can concentrate a little on that, especially because now I'm especially hoping to see some elephants. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? So we're almost at Treehouse Dam. Our first waterfall to visit. And the steam of course is Speaking of steep, let me send you that. Well, welcome back, everybody. Sorry about the audio issues there. You are with us here once again on Rusty and all of these seep lines. You can see these puddles of water. It's normally a quarry or two, and then a band of silver clust leaves just above. All over the place, these seep lines are flowing and are full. And I can hear something splashing. Can you hear that, Johan? Yeah. Just behind this bush. Let me just reverse back, see if we can see what it is that's splashing. Sounds like an elephant. Oh, there's an elephant. Uh, we're not going to be able to get in there or go in there because of there's a lot of water. So we're just going to have a little listen to his muddy ways. That's not the Muddy Waters, the song. So a little sea plan like this can start off with just a little track. A little digging. Elephant covers itself with mud. Throws the mud all over the place. Buffalo, the rhino, warthog. Help to cool themselves. Also looks like an enormous amount of fun. And over time, that puddle gets bigger and bigger and bigger. They are termed sea plants, as I discussed briefly this morning, due to the fact that in very sandy soil, where there is a clay layer, the water hits that clay layer and pushes up. And that's why the soil is so easily saturated. Rose, well, elephants are very big, so they, they'd actually cool down very slowly and warm up very slowly. So elephants have actually got it made. Uh, their ears are enormous air conditioning systems, which help to cool down and pump up between six and nine liters of blood through the air every minute, which is a very, very cool way of cooling down. Imagine just when, you, um, when you're hot and you take your shirt off or hat off and the wind blows over that area, how much cooling that does. Obviously, we sweat. But the elephants have got very thin membrane of skin behind the ear and that blood pumping to the surface with the flapping of the ears facilitates enormous amounts of cooling. Uh, and being a very big animal, it takes a long time for them to get very warm. But then at the same time, they can also swim. They can splash themselves with mud. Are oh, you right there, Jan? Can I move forward just a touch? Oh, sorry. I thought maybe that was a bit of you. My mistake. They also cool themselves with mud, and as we saw in Pridelands, they seem to swim all of the time. He's now listening to us and going, who's that talking over there? Who's watching me mud wallow? It's not the same, is it, everybody, if you're wallowing the mud on your own? If you're wallowing and someone's watching you, it feels a bit weird. <laughs> feels a bit weird to be watched. He's saying, come and join me and just watch. Come and join the mud party. So there is still abundance of water all over the place. Mr. W, they do. Um, ideally, we keep them out, so there's an elephant-proof or two-strand fence that's sort of about six and a half feet high 
which is supposed to keep the big elephants out. The youngsters can obviously come through, but they won't generally come through on their own. And the objective of that is to keep elephants out of the camp. Um, but where our vehicle passes through, there's a little stretchy wire that is supposed to be put on quite regularly to prevent elephants walking through there. But every now and again, that does not happen. And I believe while I was away, a big elephant bull walked right into camp, right into where we eat, uh, to the marula tree above our heads that uh, produces probably the largest marula fruits I've ever seen. He just gobbled them all up and then slightly damaged the pathway on the way out. But uh, other than that, you wouldn't even have known he was there. Um, and Paul, who's on Trisha's car, was actually uh, popping out of his room to go and brush his teeth. And he opened the door to find a giant elephant two meters away from his door. So he promptly walked back inside and closed the door. I think he went without tooth brushing, teeth brushing that evening. <laughs> But uh, I was discussing with him then that if elephants do come into camps like that, or do come close to buildings, um, they're very relaxed, very docile. They know that you're there. They're not going to come into camp and then suddenly get a fright that there's people there and behave in a certain way. They knew long before that you were there. The smell of us is pretty much lingering all over the place. So it's no surprises. It's just when they do get into camps, it's very important to just try to leave them alone Try not to chase them away because obviously that can make them quite grumpy and annoyed and you don't want a grumpy elephant in camp. If it's in camp and it got in because maybe we've left a fence open, well then let him go out on his own accord. It's like if you push something, it pushes back. Okay, well it looks like he's moving off a little bit. Not getting the best view, are you, Jan? Let's maybe uh, carry on, see if we can find that other herd. It's just a little bit too far off in the bushes there. Okay, well, I heard last night that Kyle was interested in joining the burpee challenge. So we're gonna go over to Twalu Kalahari this afternoon, say good day and see how many burpees he's done. It depends how many burpees it is per day. But for conservation, I would go all out. A very good afternoon, everybody. We heard of tracks um, seen on one of the roads just east of us. And uh, these two flat cats gave myself and BK a little bit of a run around. But at the end, we were victorious. And um, very lazy and relaxed at this point in time. So good afternoon, my name is Carl. Welcome to Swada Kalahari. Behind the camera is BK, my partner in crowd for this Yeah, boy. And thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful and very sunny afternoon. Um, these boys had moved oh, about 90 meters from the road. Myself and BK wrapped around. Just understanding animal behavior is very important, um, especially on when and where they should go to. So we thought initially, definitely to the watering hole. Maybe there's some prey there. So you wrapped around, there were no tracks. And I said to be oh my word, what is going on here now? So we doubled back. We looked where the tracks went off. Went back around and eventually I thought, BK, I need to just track here quickly. And then found them just snoozing under a tree, which is fantastic. So you folks would be very accommodated with these two boys. These are the two dominant uh, male cheetah within this given area and uh, definitely one of the most relaxed groups that we have. BK getting nice and close there, those beautiful spots, those lovely tear lines. I heard you folks talking about the way in which cheetah communicate, uh, obviously which one would be visually and those black tear lines would be there too accentuate or express more aggression giving the cat a very dominating very aggressive posture because they need to play a very strong bluff hand because they don't have the tools and the weapons necessary to fend off larger carnivores so they need to really do everything <laughs> in their power to deter other cats or other carnivores
So a very different scene in comparison to from this morning, where that beautiful, very gloomy cloud cover dominating Tualu. And it is all sunny this side this afternoon. And obviously that is kicking up the plant's metabolic processes. Oh, Andrew, how do you age a cheetah? Well, Andrew, it's, um, aging animals is a, is a fairly difficult thing. Uh, over time, if you have the luxury of working closely with a certain species or being a guide like us, um, over time you can definitely get a knack of aging animals, but it is tricky, um, don't get me wrong. So one way they look at the teeth, um, the coloration of the teeth. So for males, they can look older than they actually are because obviously the, the amount of fighting that they go through in their lives. So the bodies do get tattered and worn down a lot more than, for example, females. Um, but teeth are very, very reliable indicators. So you'll find that once it catches into its you know, well into its ears, its teeth start going um, a fairly yellowy colour, or pale first in the beginning and then yellow in uh, their late years. These boys are about 10, 11. <laughs> yeah, 10, 11, maybe even close to 12 now. So they have lived a very fruitful life. That is about the maximum age you would find a cheetah living to, give or take, obviously, where the cats are, um, and also other larger carnivores in the activity or presence of them um, can also lower that long term that um, life length um, but yeah they've lived a very fruitful life here on the eastern side and um, obviously having a lot of prey abundance and they've been clever on how they have eluded other carnivores and you can see from their behavior and how relaxed they are so cheetah are always on the lookout and they are always ready to get up and go. And they have to be. Um, BK, can you come to the right here? Folks, we're just going to grab your attention quickly. There's a lovely bird here. We've seen it before, but it's just prominently displayed. Oh, it oh gone, it went down. It looks like it caught something. And there it goes. I've pointed. I used my finger. Never point at something. Our head is up. <laughs> it's almost like they know. <laughs> so our plan of action was to look for cheetah this afternoon and uh, we will definitely spend a little bit of time here, see what they do. Um, Vicky, that's a very good question. Vicky, so cheetahs, yeah, it all depends on where they are. So um, you can find that, that their sleeping period would vary depending on their location within the continent. Um, they can sleep soundly if they feel very comfortable, like these two male cheetah are now. They're very comfortable. You can see the heads are down. They are flat cats right now. But you can still see they are vigilant. They are still keeping their senses tuned into the environment. So, whew, how long do they sleep for? We know that lions sleep a lot. <laughs> We've watched lions a lot sleeping and snoozing throughout the day. Um, so this midday period, I'd say a few hours within, within a day, within the daylight hours, especially through the hotter periods when it is not viable or not efficient for you to move around. This is when you would lay down and snooze and conserve energy. So Vicky, I'd say a couple of hours a day. Um, and at night time, they'll find a bush, a nice spot where they feel very, very safe. And then there, they'll just relax and rest. Um, I don't think I've actually read, or maybe I cannot recall, if there's a specific period and how many hours per 24-hour cycle they'll sleep. So Vicky, I'll take a look in a couple of minutes and if I do find something, I will let you know, Vicky.
Hi, my name is Damon and I'm a guide here at Ambion Pinder Private Game Reserve. Join me and our resident ecologist, Craig Shelter Douglas, at the fireside on the 21st of March for a discussion on two of our conservation projects. In early 2016, Ambion was faced with the fact that without some serious intervention, our rhino population could be in some serious trouble. And so a decision was made to start a rhino dehorning program. Sadly, the fastest mammal on land, the cheetah, is also racing towards extinction. The Ambion Pinda Conservation Team has been working on a project that aims to increase the genetic integrity of cheetah in protected areas around the country. Sign up to be a wild earth explorer and join us for a lively debate where we'll answer as many of your questions as possible. Our lives are dictated by alarm clocks, traffic jams, constant multitasking and countless distractions. The wilderness is where many of us feel the most human. On a bushwalk, we become part of the natural landscape. As you step off the vehicle, everything comes alive. As with any risky experience, walking amongst these animals inspires awe and appreciation. Now it's your turn to go on a bushwalk. Join us from Pride Lands as we slow down our thoughts, put aside our distractions, and reconnect with a place that first taught us how to be human. Hello, I'm Marna, your Wild Earth Safari Guide from and Beyond Gala. What I really like about connecting with Wild Earth viewers is that we get to speak to viewers instantly and I get to show you this beautiful property. If you want to ask me a question, register on the Wild Earth website, simply head over to the Live Safari page and you can submit your questions there. Join me or one of the other guides twice a day on Wild Earth. Good afternoon and welcome to and beyond Ngala where we are looking at the clouds what a beautiful display we have this afternoon quite lucky in that now I'm Yopi behind the camera we've got Gert and we set out this afternoon checked along the river a little bit see if we can pick up on any tracks and we are actually looking for lions in this area and there were also four cheetahs seen here but exactly where they are at this moment we're not too sure they've moved from their last position and there were reports that the cheetahs were looking to hunt early morning and scaring off some of the animals like the impala and the wildebeest within this area they or alerting them also drew the attention of the lions which was not too far from where they were and from what i heard they moved over towards their side and at this point we still haven't seen any clear signs of any of them but i'm pretty sure with the heat we had today they wouldn't have gone too far now this is quite a unique area that we have here it's actually part of a flood plain it's not too far from the Timbavati riverbed, quite an open space with lots of stands of magic quarry. Most of the trees you see around here, they are all magic quarry stands. And it's also quite a unique tree in its own way. It always has leaves on it. Almost always. It never gets eaten. It's a little bit bitter, very high in tannins to protect itself from browsers. Actually some of the few animals I've noticed that do eat it on occasions is giraffe and then on occasions kudu, some bushbuck. I've even once or twice seen elephant eat it. But the good thing about high tannin levels and the fact that the leaves are quite leathery is that it also provides good shade. So in this particular area 
what I've noticed is when you are looking for lions or cheetah, which will be drawn by the large open spaces here, so we can see, you'll notice some animal trails going through the long grass. There's lots of long grass in this area at the moment. And because it's so open, it attracts small herds of wildebeest and lots of impala, which in turn attracts the predators. Now we've just started to see the first signs of the changing season. You can see the grasses are not as green. It's not as green as it used to be. It's um, started to change its color a little bit. And um, we can also start to feel the change in temperature in the mornings and the late afternoon. But today it's still very hot and now this cloud cover and a slight breeze has just picked up. It's actually been a bit of a saving grace for us. And that's why I'm still hoping that we'll have luck with these cheetah or the lion. Leslie, do I think that cheetahs have a favorite tree spot? Um, yes, I think so. Some cheetahs I found in this particular area, this clearing that we're looking at at the moment is um, one of the largest open spaces that we have on the reserve. And what I've noticed is because it's so dense in other areas, especially around the riverbeds, we find that the cheetahs, when they do move across Angola, they come and they move along certain clearings, um, which makes it slightly easier for us to track them in a sense when they come through here. Because you wouldn't normally be tracking cheetah in this particular area on foot, um, unless there's signs that they've been hunting nearby or that they might have had a kill nearby, then you'd try for that. But normally cheetahs in this particular area move fast distances especially a female cheetah with cubs, like she might be moving around a certain area for a couple of days. Now, from what I've heard, these cheetahs have been in this particular area for the last two, three days. And it's quite a special thing for us because we don't normally see that many cheetahs. But as the season starts to change, that's when we start to see them more and more in Gala, at least for a month or two. I think with all the young impala and the impalas in this particular area, it's a good, good spot for the mother cheetah to bring her three cubs. Now in there, on the other side of this clearing, where you can see the taller trees, we have a little pan. And I think that is where I'm going to go have a look. But while I continue for the search for these cheetahs, we will send you over to, to Tualu, where they actually have some cheetahs. Which are snoozing. I can definitely say that for the past 30 minutes, cheetahs do sleep on average for 30 minutes a day. I'm just joking. So yeah, Vicky, that was a very good question. I'm trying to rack my brain thinking about if I've ever read anything about how much a cheetah would sleep. That would definitely vary across the continent of Africa. Um, so it would, and if they do rest um, and they sleep soundly, it'll be through the midday period when larger carnivores are a little more inactive because of the heat of the day. And then if you take a look at the onset of night where a cheetah don't have very good eyesight under the cover of the darkness, they won't move unless absolutely necessary. Although there has been research done by, I think it's Gus Mills in the Kalahari, the central Kalahari part, um, and they have actually found that cheetah will actively hunt even with a little bit of moonlight. So it just shows you that from what we have read as guides and naturalists that, you know, what you're reading in a book is not set in stone. Um, nature is constantly changing. We are learning every single day. So uh, that period and where they would rest would definitely vary but through the midday period when it's very very hot that's when they'll take a nice snooze um, and then through the darkest of nights so new moons um, yeah, well, I found cheetah here on Swalu that 
coming onto full moon two, three days before full moon, full moon and two, three days afterwards, they are very active under the cover of darkness. They sleep until sunset and then only when sunset hits do these cats become mobile. And being in a, in a, in a band of brothers like this, they can dominate this territory and obviously defend it from rival males and stay in charge for a lot longer. So cats like this being in a, in a band of brothers two, three, even four times, they can hold onto territories for up to six years. I've read that in the Serengeti that a trio held a territory there for about six years, which is very, very lengthy. And that obviously gives them access to females and then access to males. And then they would fend off males from that area. And they are very mobile. So every two, three days, yeah, two, three days that scent, you know, they'll move from point to point to point and they'll just be scent marking. And that's because that urine that they're using for a way of communication, of demarking these territories, the intensity or the smell does not last for very long. So they constantly have to be mobile on the boundary of their territories, which they have very specific points that they mark on. So this could be a specific tree, even a specific rock that they would either urinate or or uh, defecate on to apply new fresh scent just to ward off any intruders into those areas. So they're very, very mobile cats and I love watching Tita. Because he's getting quite hot even in the shade. Beautiful solid spots, obviously aiding camouflage hiding away from predators, but then also getting up close to prey. Lee do male and females have the same markings. Uh, they both have spots, but each coat is unique to each individual. It's like, a, it's like your fingerprint. So each individual have its own unique spot pattern across its body, uh, which is a way in which we can actually recognize individuals. So we could use spots around the whiskers, around the cheekbone, especially when they reach maturity. Um, you can use this spot patterning to identify it, along with other features like scars or maybe nicks in the ears. Um, so yeah, it's a very, very unique uh, pattern to each individual. Oh, we got some stretching. Uh -huh. You are hungry. You want to go eat? No. <laughs> oh, so resting heart rate here would be at about 100 beats a minute. And I mean, when they chase an animal, they double that. So when you can have a spot just to rest and conserve energy, you're gonna, you're gonna utilize it. Um, it is still a little bit warm although we do have a beautiful cool breeze blowing in from the north this afternoon. Just keeping it nice. Desert cysticula calling behind us. often do cheetahs need to eat? So if you take a look at um, it'll be every average three to four days, give or take, you know, it, that also depends <clears throat> on where these cats are as well and what they are eating. Um, you can have them going a few more days, obviously being unsuccessful. You've got to think about the skills necessary for this cat to have a successful attempt on item it needs to stalk within 50 30 meters that's very close without being detected and then from there have the skills necessary and outwitting this animal to kill it so small to medium size prey animals is what cheetah will be focusing on due to its very small teeth its lack of big muscles and big sharp claws like a lion um, so where they can really tackle um, medium ranged animals and being in a band of brothers like this they are able to bring down larger prey so serengeti also depends on what prey availability is in the area is what they're used to 
So in the Serengeti, I mean, they can take out fully grown wildebeest. We have these two boys pulling down older oryx, which is a very dangerous animal to hunt. So on average, three, four days, and then also depends on prey density. In these western set areas where prey is more sparsely set, you'd find that maybe it's five to seven days that they'll eat. And then obviously the walking distance that they would cover is a lot larger in comparison to Kruger or Serengeti. So um, there's many variables, but average three to four days, I would say. And um, there would be a higher chance of them being successful being two males, obviously to bring down larger animals. Well, from these two lazy cats, let's send you over to Steve at a watering hole. Welcome to Bivelsook, everybody. We're, we are camped out at um, Rumping Post Dam, which is uh, looking very good still. It's probably the, the least amount of water in a watering hole that I've seen so far with this beautiful little Egyptian goose who is on its own last time I was here. Hasn't found a friend since. But in this wonderful watching hole and in a couple of the others, I was asked a few questions by some viewers last time and I didn't have the answer. This floating plant that we have growing here with a beautiful yellow flower is called the creeping Ludwigia. Ludwigia stolonifera. The stolonifera means creeping, runners or shoots. Sort of a stolon is like the above uh, growing part of a grass when it runs along the surface as above ground stem. So it's a creeping, floating plant that is indigenous and occurs on watering bodies. And we've seen it boost or boom in the last couple of years. And it really seems to be taking over. But what's really interesting about it is that it provides the perfect habitat and breeding habitat for birds such as the jacana, the lesser moorhen, probably the common moorhen as well. Uh, they like to nest on floating sort of vegetation. Little grebes as well make floating nests. So very important for the diversity of certain organisms. And this plant in general is actually visited by ants and thrips when the time is right. So if they can get across <laughs> the water to them, they would have these organisms living on them. So there we go, the creeping Ludwigia. Hope that helps everybody part of the evening primrose family. Four genera in South Africa. And Ludwigia is named after D.G. Ludwig, who died in 1773. He's a German botanist, if you were at all interested. usually in very wet, swampy areas like this one. I'm going to allow you to listen for a moment to chin spot batters. The Cameroptera. and I haven't been able to find any medicinal properties for it so far but I will be looking I will be looking unfortunately there's it's a very limited amount of information published on many of the medicinal plants and properties around so it needs to be found no doubt there are it almost seems like every plant has got some form of medicine
Seth, there could always be crocodiles, anywhere 50 kilometre radius from a cro cro crocodile infested watering hole. Um, I haven't seen one yet, but uh, there were definitely hippo tracks coming down the road towards this watering hole. So hippos and crocodiles are quite mobile. But I doubt there would be a crocodile in here because there wouldn't be any food. I doubt there'd be any food. Crocodiles, although everybody knows them as these ghastly organisms that feed on animals, actually feed primarily on fish rather than mammals. They will feed on mammals, of course, when the opportunity presents itself. But they feed almost primarily on fish and small crocodiles. Obviously, when they're small, they only feed on fish. And when they're bigger, they feed on crocodiles as well as fish and small mammals. So, And birds, like this Egyptian goose, skating so effortlessly through the water. Okay, well our plan for the afternoon being up of a follow up on the wild dogs that were seen around this morning. And while we do so we're gonna send you over to Yapi who's had success on his search. Luckily for us, we didn't have to look too far. And even away in the shade of a magic quarry, we've come across this heavily panting male lion. Now notice how he's literally shaking his whole body, his head shaking. You can see the eyes are closing. I don't know if our viewers notice, but there's so many flies around the eyes. Actually, there's a lot of flies around that face. The whole face is covered in them, to be honest. And if you ask me, look, let's say we. There, just have a look at the size of that belly. You can see all the flies on the belly as well, and then the tail flicking. Now, these are all signs that I take of animals that's been feeding. There's another one to the back of that line. And this one's hidden away. In the grass, you can just see the tail flicking there. I don't, it doesn't, if I compare the two, it doesn't look to me like the belly's as for, ooh, it's a nice stretch. So opening up the legs there. And you can see the leaves of the tree and the leaves around them is moving, and that's because there's a slight, actually a nice cool breeze that's just picked up. Maybe he's trying to use that to his advantage and cool down the belly area. And of this lion, my lion, usually it's got the darker upper side and then quite a light or pale, almost golden in some senses, color underneath. And the fur seems to be a lot less in lot less thick than it is from the rest of the on the upper side of the body. Now with the belly being as full as it is, there's a lot of veins running along the underside of the lion. And all of that's transporting the blood. And with that cool breeze blowing over it, the lion's literally cooling down a little bit. And it's also slightly more comfortable. Eddie, how big is a fully grown male lion? It varies a lot, actually. Um, they can be anywhere between 
150 kilograms and they've even been weighed up to all the way to 250 kilograms. They vary in size according to region, also depends on their genetics. In this case, these two male lions aren't that big. They're starting to reach the final years of their lives. They're quite old already, more or less 11 years old. And even though their manes are still getting darker and darker, they are comparatively quite small. And at least compared to some of the females in the pride that they usually move with, and even compared to other males in this particular area. And if I, I wouldn't know even what to estimate the weight of each of these lions. I know the one closest to us, the one on his back. He seems slightly taller, a little bit more bulky than the other one at the back. And I'm pretty sure he's heavier as well than that one. You can see that foot there. You can see as it's in that position, you can see the muscles on the back legs. heavy shallow breathing there but that's what leaves the paw prints Kingston very good question how long do lions live for well that's also something that changed from one area to the next and it depends on the competition and lots of other factors environmental factors but generally speaking, in this particular area, 10 years of age for a male lion is quite old. So these two are already in quite an advanced age. They can live longer, up to 15 years in the wild in an extreme case. But then again in captivity where there's not a lot of competition from other males and they don't have to fight to survive they can live even longer even up to the ripe old age of 18 but what's interesting about these two is even though they're already 11 years old i've noticed with male lions reaching around about nine to ten years you can start to see how they start deteriorating but um, in this case, these two are still quite strong. And I guess it's because they eat very well in this area. But while these lions are enjoying the shade here, we're going to send you over to Tualu with the cheetah. <laughs> From lions in the shade to cheetahs in the shade. Huh. It's a shady afternoon. So just to recap on that great question I was asked, that how much would a cheetah eat on average? So typically a single cheetah would eat every three or four days. Um, these boys, bringing down larger prey, they can go a little bit longer. Obviously with the amount of food they can take in at one sitting. So at one sitting a male cheetah like this could eat about 12 kilograms, which is quite a lot of meat at one go. Um, so that's another variable, but if you look at a female with cubs, a female with cubs would have to almost hunt on a day-to-day -day basis to keep those little ones nourished. I remember reading along the lines that I think the female had three-month-old cubs, so definitely hungry little tummies. She had caught 35 gazelles, and I think it was a hare. 35 gazelles and one hare in 31 days. So it shows you how variable the intake amount would be depending on 
what individual you are looking at. If it's a female or if it's two males, if it's a single individual, that is obviously a very varied um, outcome. Uh, but on average, you're looking at about 1.5 to about 4 kilograms, if I'm not mistaken, is a daily intake that a cheetah needs to keep itself going, which is, which is quite a lot. Think about that. 1.5 to 4 kilograms of meat, a daily food intake. It's quite a lot. But these guys, I bet you are dreaming of <laughs> the food intake. And I hope towards the, the later part of the afternoon that they do get up. If they don't, we are going to go search for something else for you folks. Um, definitely will not waste the time on a vehicle. We are in the bush and there's lots of other things to see. It is lovely seeing sleeping cheetah. And we are very grateful, but there's a lot of other things to find. I found cheetah sleeping in very strange ways. Tracy, the largest prey item I have seen cheetah take down is an oryx uh, here on Swalu. And it was actually a couple of hundred meters just off of our position now. And then when I was guiding in the Eastern Cape, I worked for a beautiful little reserve called Amakala. And I saw a coalition of four males bring down a fully grown wildebeest, um, which was obviously very, very intense. So my personal experience is Oryx over here on Swallow, which is a large animal and an animal that... Uh, if you joined us this morning, you could see those two males going at each other. They have got immense power. Power to weight ratio, antelope are phenomenally strong. They definitely will drive a cheat in and could detrimentally affect it. Obviously, it's very lightweight bone structure. One little injury could be disastrous. And so they need to be very, very careful on what and when they hunt. How are you doing there, Vico? Enjoying the cheetah? Yep. Yeah. Can you put that down a bit, please? I'm absolutely delighted to have won the February prize draw for three nights for six people at the Juma Private Game Reserve. I absolutely love everything Wild Earth has to offer. I find the guides extremely knowledgeable and will go above and beyond to ensure a great safari experience. I will be taking my husband and family from the UK to experience this once in a lifetime opportunity. One of the main reasons I joined the Wild Earth Explorer program was for the fireside chats and also to win an incredible prize, which I'm so fortunate to win and incredibly happy. I would like to thank Wild Earth for this amazing prize and cannot wait to meet the team. For all of you Wild Earth explorers who bought plaques, today is the day that you will make your very first safari on our vehicle. Because we are quite remote here in the bush, they have taken some time to arrive, but I am happy to say they are here and they look great. Marcel has spent the day attaching them. Let's take a look. Before we mount these nameplates, we just give a light dusting of green paint. This is to better match them to the colour of the vehicles and also to decrease the reflectivity of the metal and thereby staying sensitive towards the animals. Bumble Crew, hopefully Dan Black, Liesel Apgar and Alicia George. Well, it's time for me to get ready to take you all on a safari. Let's go. I got into wildlife filmmaking because of a passion for nature and a notion that I could make a difference. Helping others fall in love with nature brings meaning to what I do. It's also a lot of fun. 
A couple of times per week, we receive some very heartfelt messages from viewers telling us about how Wild Earth has made a difference in their life, whether it's helped them through a difficult period or simply helped them to reconnect with nature. I think that's why we do what we do. Hello everybody, sorry about that. Gremlins are at strong, strong today. But Rusty seems to be going strong as ever. Those of you who don't know what I'm talking about when I say the word Rusty, this is Rusty. The formidable Rusty, who's been around the block more than, more than once. <laughs> this is the area somewhere this side that um, the dogs were seen this morning so not knowing exactly where they were they could move they could just sit down and they might utilize the road if they did move but there's water everywhere so trying to gauge from the water where they could be is very difficult this time of year. Okay, well while we try to find our fast dogs, we're going to send you over to Twalu Kalahari. With Yo, Steve is looking for wild dogs. Lucky, sure. I wish them all the best that side. It's very exciting trying to narrow down wild dogs. Well, just as it is looking for here. The tracking element in the bush is such an exciting thing. Um, it almost puts you in this predator prey kind of mindset, you know, following the tracks, understanding where the animal possibly could go to. You know, how could I make the trip shorter? Where would I go to if I was that animal? It's a very exciting thing and Leading up to the animal is, is by far utilizing the tracking element is is really an amazing part of, of being on a safari. And uh, South Africa can boast at having some of the most skillful trackers in the world. There's some individuals that are just mind boggling. But it's something that you really have to practice at. If you don't practice it, you are not going to reap the rewards and you'll get frustrated but if you put in that time and that effort just like exercise just like studies if you put in a little bit of effort the rewards start coming through you feel so great there is really a humbling thing an ancient art <laughs> these two flat cats have not moved much we had a little rollover but uh, we are starting to move on to a cooler part now we're hopefully they will move. That bird, my man. So when myself and Beak came through that pan, we did locate on a nice bird. Um, you folks would have seen it with Deirdre, an Adam's stalk. Adam's stalk, yeah. Um, there's one actually sitting at this pan on the southern side. So maybe when we leave these boys for a few minutes, we'll go take a look at what is in and around that watering hole. So these two boys, their territory spans for oh, about 60, 70 kilometers. You can get territories being a little bit larger than that, 80, 90. 
and you can get territories being larger at that if you go to Serengeti and the drier parts of southern Africa um, these territories can be fairly extensive but home range is obviously a very large area that an animal would wander through um, so females can wander quite far in their lifetime and we haven't seen mother and three for a while I wonder where she has gone past couple of days we've really well, past month I would say all the guides and trackers have been really struggling with the amount of ground cover Darcy Ann um, strange oh. yeah I think intriguing for me I think when it comes to the courtship um, display that is by far the most exciting or not exciting I can't really use that as a way to explain the most strangest yeah the courtship is definitely the most strangest for me when it comes to cheetah so a courtship um, ritual which can be quite aggressive when they locate a female um, but other strange behavior I've done, I can't really say to be totally honest with you Darcy um, if something comes to mind, I'll let you know. My hard drive's working a little slower today. I need to increase my RAM. Yeah, so if they do pick up scent of a female coming to Easter, they can follow her for a couple of days and be very persistent at it. And then she obviously, when they get a bit closer there, she can act very aggressively towards them. Really remarkable cats. And it's a real privilege to be sitting here and watching them, but also for you viewers back home, just taking the necessary time to sit there and just watch these amazing cats of Africa is, is a truly remarkable thing because the more awareness we can create, the better it would be for these cats in the future and for future generations. I couldn't imagine of a little kid wishing to see a cheetah, but they were extinct. I couldn't fathom that. It just makes my heart melt. Um, Elton, I didn't catch the viewer's name there, but absolutely. Um, that mother and three that comes through here, um, one of these males will definitely be the father of uh, those cubs. Um, but yeah, great question. So definitely um, this, one of these boys would be the father um, of those lovely little cats. We might get a little bit of action here. We might get a head being lifted. We have another guy just coming in to view these lovely animals and shows you how relaxed they are, <laughs> not bothered. So over the few years they have just obviously seen vehicles over countless years and they just know that a vehicle means absolutely no threat. But it's also due to the respect that has been given from the guards and trackers of Tuali, but then also the the rules that have been placed down by this great reserve to ensure that these animals are not pushed in any way. So over a given period, this is the behavior that we have. I mean, we are only about 15 meters from them. They would act differently if I had to get off on foot. See those very long whiskers. Very important tools. Picking up wind direction, 
when they're moving through areas also to feel, you know, when, if they can move through something. It's a very important form of tactile or touch. Look how fast his respiration is, his breathing. It's like our dog after a run. Beautiful. <laughs> you almost can't see where one starts and where one stops. So it shows you how efficient those spots work. So what we're going to do, I think, folks, is maybe we're going to leave these two males here, just let them rest for a bit, and um, maybe let's go take a little drive to the pan, and let's see what we can find there for you folks. Because I'm not going to do much for the next couple of minutes. It is lovely watching them in the shade. But in the meantime being, if we can find other things and wait for the activity levels to increase, that would be wonderful. So maybe let's start up and let's head out and around the corner. All right, so when it comes to off-roading, obviously a very... It is a privilege and you always got to do it with the utmost of caution and respect. But we're going to get back to a road, but let's send over to Steve for a little update. Welcome back everybody. Well, it seems like we're not getting any signal where we were, so we're going to come back over to Juma and see what else we can find. Maybe make our way down towards the south, go check out Chitwa. But the dogs have not come back uh, south, so I found where they were, where Trish was broken down and where the dogs went in. We've checked Tambuti Dam, we've checked Rubbing Post Dam. There are neither of those, so they haven't come south, so they're probably either lying up just in the block, or they've moved north or east. I'm back in now at uh, Mvubu Road. Go over to Vuit Dam to see what's happening. It really depends. Sometimes I've driven 500 meters and found a leopard and spent the whole drive with them. And uh, sometimes I've driven the whole drive. So 20 kilometers maybe is the furthest here. Maybe 25 at the most. In the Mara, goodness, we used to drive very far. Very, very far. That was probably 100, 200 kilometers a day. Sometimes more. It's very difficult to put a number on that, Peter. Oh, this is my, this is my favorite place. All of a sudden, look at all of this dwarf sage. Goodness me. Now, those of you who don't know dwarf sage, dwarf sage is a very water-loving plant, and it didn't used to grow here. It's everywhere. I'm just going to frolic in it. Frolic. <laughs> okay, so you pick a little bit, and you crush it, just like this, and you... Hmm. Quite euphoric. It's really, really a pleasant... pleasant smell. For the South Africans out there, it smells like Vicks, but much better than Vicks. And for those new viewers who have not watched the show, I... have an affinity for this plant. I'll actually show you the flower. It's not the best example. As you can see, there's plenty of it. 
I don't have my gumboots. There's plenty of it. So there is the flower, a little purple, beautiful flower. And um, I've told viewers over the years that this plant is my favorite smelling plant out here. Not just because I enjoy the smell, but it actually gives you a little bit of a boost. Um, when I used to train at Eco Training, uh, and the students started feeling a little bit lazy, or what we say in South Africa, a bit lay, a bit lazy, um, I would give them all a branch of this, make them inhale it, stand up, do a few sort of stretches, and then on we'd go with the lecture, and you suddenly had very attentive students. Very nice, very nice. It's all over the place, very water loving, and it's gonna do very, very well with this time of year. And the fragrance, of course, is very, very pungent, and it's probably designed to prevent it from being eaten by insects. Elaine, it's not edible. You don't see it being eaten by anything. And I have done this before, but for purposes of repetition. Oh. Mm. Elaine, I do not recommend doing that. very taut and the chemical smell like with lavender and rosemary as examples that I think everybody is familiar with nothing eats lavender and rosemary the flowers obviously pollinate it but it's only us humans who use it for for cooking but we don't eat it raw uh, we burn it we smudge with it it's got very strong smells it actually works as a very good insect repellent in your garden by planting that stuff around. So any plant that's very fragrant, the fragrance not there for an animal to come along and go, ooh, that smells lovely. It's there to keep things from eating it. The, the smell, or well, the fragrance is its medicinal properties. It's, uh, it's protection against insects and animals. Okay, well, we're going to carry on along Vuba Road, see what we can find. We're going to send you over to Kyle, who's at a dam doing some birding. All right. Yo, we came in here and I was like, oh, the bird is gone. And BK said, under the tree over there, there it sits. All right, lovely bird to see. We have seen it before, but if you haven't, this is a bird referred to Abdom's stalk. And a very nice bird to see at that. It's, um, it does range south from its breeding grounds, in the non-breeding season, sorry. Um, and then all the way down to South Africa through favorable periods that we've just gone through. Now, obviously, the amount of rain, these birds would range further south. And there is one or two defining characteristics and how we can recognize this lovely bird. So if you look over here now, perfectly set. Look at those red joints just below the belly. That is a very distinct, distinguishing factor about this bird. And then, oopsie, <laughs> a little bit of uh, weight reduction. <laughs> and then it's red feet. Mm -hmm. It's got a little something, something. So food, mainly insects, grasshoppers, locusts, and crickets, and then also small invertebrates. So these armored ground catadids now would be a very, and that's what it's got, a very viable source of food for this bird. So those red joints, the red feet, and then if you look when it turns, you can see this bare skin, which is blue. Um, that would be duller through the non-breeding season, and then when it goes into breeding, that um, that blue patch would become more prominently displayed and then if you look at the very tip of the beak that very long heavy bill it is red so very very easy to to recognize you can get it mistaken or mixed up melded up with another bird a black stalk which does look very similar mm. a little drink scooping the water and then lifting its head back up How oh, remarkable. Oh, 
Wesley, so this is the first time in my guiding career that I, or, sorry, first time in the period working here at Swalu, or guiding, sorry, here at Swalu that I've seen this stalk. We have seen black stalk. Um, just trying to think of other stalk species that I've seen here. A black stalk in the, in the summer period is seen um, every now and then. Um, mm, I'm just trying to think. I think the guides did see a marabou stalk out west, which was very, very nice to see. We've also seen white stalk as well. It's also a bird that's been seen here. It also comes down in the non-breeding period, which is very, very nice to see. Um, and that'll be it. Yeah, so white stalk, marabou stalk, and then um, the black stalk. Um, but this is a first for me on Tualima. Nearly five years, sure, wandering through these undulating dunes. I can't believe it's been five years already. It doesn't feel like it. it. feels like a couple of weeks. But a very nice bird to see and it's just something exciting when these birds just suddenly pop up. There's something different, you know. And that's the thing about birding is that you always have a chance of seeing something new. So if you've been birding for a while and you are slow on the life list, there is still always a chance that you're going to see something rare or something unexpected which is always very very exciting for me um kg do all stalk species hunt the same way mm, no kg um so for example, this individual will be feeding on grasshoppers and locusts. Um, if you take a look at the black stalk, mainly fish um, and frogs, tadpoles. So it'll be wading in the water and actually jabbing at the, the prey item, which would be tadpoles and, and that of uh, frogs. If you look at a marabou stalk, that is primarily a scavenger. But it is also able, don't get me wrong, to catch its own prey, such as mice. Um, birds, fish, um, and then insects as well. A marabou stalk is a very, very dominant, very large species within and amongst other stalk species. Um, I'm trying to think of a saddlebolt stalk. Um, a saddlebolt stalk, I think, would eat mainly fish as well, also frogs, also by jabbing or using that bill, striking into the water and actually grabbing prey items. So it would vary slightly uh, depending on the species on what they feed on and as well as how they feed. Um, very, very nice. And if you take a look when they're all congregating in the area, when you have a lot of them, they'd also have their own feeding method. Sure, Marabou stalk, I'm still waiting for the day I get to see that very unique looking species. It'll even outcompete vultures at a carcass. It's a very big bird, around about, I think it's around about 7 kilograms they can weigh. So a very dominating individual around a, water, around a food source. Oh, blacksmith lapwings. I think I saw a little three-banded plover in the mix of things over here. Uh, BK, can you go to the left for us, please? Where those blacksmith lapwings are going. Just to the left of them, you're going to see a tiny little bird. Oh, it's a little bit dark. Okay, right there. It's a little bit dark to see it. But there's a little bird there. It's a little bit far as well. Which is called a three-banded plover. Also very prominent, small wading species found in and amongst these pans and watering holes. Always very important to take a look carefully with your binoculars um, in and amongst the undergrowth and then along the water's edge because you can find these rarities. I found a yellow wagtail at this pan before, which was a very exciting find for me and also a very um, big tick for my life list. Yo, B 
Peter. Oh, Peter has flew straight over us. On the 27th of April, Wild Earth will be turning 14 years old, and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all of you. And to celebrate, we will be finishing the beautiful book that we started last year that looks at the history so far. But we do need you to be part of it. Please submit your most memorable sighting, or what Wild Earth means to you, or even just your name and a comment to be included inside the book. Head over to the website to add your name and reserve your copy. We are offering a 20% discount on all books bought before the end of March. And a big thank you to all of you who have contributed to the book so far. With a slew of potential dangers lurking, it's essential to be aware of your surroundings whilst walking in the wilderness. 20 yards away from one of the most endangered species. This is a big bull. What a moment, what a close encounter with an Ellie bull. He's just over here now. He's moved completely away. Being on a bushwalk and seeing a leopard, I mean, it's ridiculous to be this close to a leopard on foot and for him not to run is absolutely insane. How crazy was that? Through the gap there, it's just the back of the head of a male lion. He is absolutely unaware that we are here right now. I tell you, seeing lions on foot, is, it, it, it definitely brings out the caveman in you, this little scared human being. It's a huge privilege to be in these incredible places with these amazing animals. I love filming lions. When they do get up and do something, it's always spectacular. When they are playing, are incredibly fun to watch, especially sub adults and cubs. I love being in the bush and working in these incredible places with these amazing animals. We want to bring it to you so that you can almost feel like you're right there and in, be able to experience it and enjoy it the way we are. showing us his feeding techniques. Here's Mama. She's very relaxed, everybody. Her eyes are almost closed. She's so relaxed. And that is evident on her calves as well. There you go, Mum. You provide a wonderful bit of shade for me. Let me just stand behind you. Feeding on the leaves there of the round leaved teak. It's generally, without elephant interference, it becomes quite a large tree. But you don't find any of them that are very big. All of these growing out of the ground there are all sort of suckers or coppice growth from large specimens that have been very badly damaged because the elephants like to eat them okay, stripping of the leaves lots of nutrients in the green leaves at the moment it's also known as bloodwood the leaves themselves have got little red spots on them almost as if little drops of blood have fallen
Hey, there he is. I mean, tuskless elephants are are a sight. Oh, you see him putting his trunk in his mouth there. That is accessing the Jacobson organ. Hello. Let me just squash you now. Uh, tusked elephants are, are more common than tuskless elephants, but tuskless elephants are not uncommon. There's a couple of herds that we find around that have got a few adult females and some calves that have inherited the gene. Um, in Addo Elephant National Park for a long time, they didn't have any tusks because of the indiscriminate hunting that happened there that removed the tusk gene altogether. But uh, tusks are obviously beneficial, so they're more common in elephants as they use them for feeding, ripping bark, fighting. And uh, I've never seen a big male elephant without tusks unless they've been broken off. I'm not saying it's not possible, but I can't recall ever seeing a giant elephant bull with no tusks. Franklins are going crazy over there. What on earth was that noise? Sounds like buffalo. Got Franklin's alarming vigorously some noises that I can only attribute to buffalo. Oh, Charles, they make it very obvious when they're agitated. I'm just going to. Uh, Maybe just move back here. Yeah, I'm going to wait a moment to sit with these ellies. I'll listen for those birds some more, but I'm pretty sure something's moving there of a predatory nature. Elephant will let you know if it's agitated, Charles. These individuals walking towards us. Have a look at the eyes. The head is almost slumped down. Trunk is loose on the ground. Almost looks like it's sulking a little bit. That's because that one is sulking a bit because the other big bull has dominated him. But an elephant that's agitated will lift its head and will look at you with a sideward glance or down its nose like your librarian teacher when she was displeased with your work. You know that look when, a, when an older lady pushes her glasses down and looks at you with her head held back? That look, we all know that look. The school teacher librarian look when they look at you with displeasure then you know that um, they are not happy with you. And when an elephant is not happy as well, they could make some noise. And a final thing that they can do is they can actually run at you. That's an aggressive sort of last stage. But elephants can't be irritated with you and eat at the same time. That's one of the telltale signs. If they're eating or drinking, or sleeping, <laughs> or bathing, or whatever they might be doing, then they are definitely okay. As soon as they're not doing any of those things and they're standing dead still, apart from when they're sleeping, you need to be aware of a change in behavior. Stuck in bed, they can travel anywhere from 5 to 15, maybe 20 kilometers a day. It's very difficult to say. I mean, sometimes of year they have to travel far for food. Now there's plenty of food. They don't have to go too far from water. Uh, they'll just slowly move and then drink and slowly move and drink. But in places where food is far less abundant, 
and they have to travel much further and then they need to drink once maybe twice a day so they have to travel that distance back to the water to feed or to drink so then it could probably get up to even as far as 20 kilometers maybe even more in some cases but that is what becomes a limiting factor in the herds of elephants because the babies obviously can't travel that far so abundance of water uh, will limit the ability of the of stress on the youngsters and if they don't have to walk far at all then all the youngsters will survive when actually in big natural systems when water should be very far apart and unavailable at times of year that natural stress that does come from time to time especially in droughts is often a, a high cause of calf mortality because they can't actually drag the calf along with them We're going to try and investigate what that funny noise I heard before while we send you back over to Tswali. Well, this stork is playing hard to get now. It gave us a great view and then flew off and sat behind that little bush. It actually looks like a little zizi fuss, a buffalo thorn within the body of water. That's the little Zizifus that we were watching that grebe, the little grebe make the nest a couple of weeks ago until the floodwaters rose. But uh, everything is fairly quiet, so uh, myself and BK thought that we would, oh, don't leave me, I will come out. Oh, there's the little grebe. <laughs> Uh, but myself and Pika thought we might as well head up a little bit further north from our position. Um, the guy that is currently with the cheetah says that there are still both flat cats. Oh, there's another one. Halala. Oh, Look at that. It was hiding. And uh, what we're going to do is see maybe if we can get the meerkats um, foraging in the block just north of us. A little bit of activity for you folks would be great now. You can see how sneaky that bird was sitting behind the tree here just on the western side of this pan. <laughs> Kiara allergies, is that what I heard? Um, Kiara, I don't think so. I could be held to correction here. Um, but I really don't think so, to be honest. That's, a, <laughs> that's actually a very good question. Um, but I'll note it and I'll see if I can ask relevant people to see if uh, I can get a more defined answer. But my gut, I'm really not too sure if birds suffer from allergies. Or any allergy, you never know. Um, maybe feral pigeons maybe suffer from some allergy, obviously being domesticated over all the years. Racing pigeons, yeah. Could possibly be. Why not? But great question. So let's leave these two lovely birds and let's take a little drive up the road here and let's see what we can see. As soon as those cats move, the guide will definitely let us know and we will be in there like hot potatoes. Okay, so 
So we will go look for these lovely meerkats for you folks. But let's send you over to somebody who's got a bird of prey. So from a dead impala to some birds of prey or vultures, in this particular case, white back vultures. Now at the moment, it's quite difficult to see why they are called this, but it's because if they had to open their wings, they've got a very white rump. And you'll notice that they are high up in the branches of dead trees. And to be exact, uh, branches of dead knob thorns. Now it's a very large bird. And for a bird like this, one could imagine it must be quite tricky to get into this small or tight spots in between branches of trees with a lot of leaves on. And you can see it looks like they're just waiting. And one sitting with his back towards the sun, that afternoon sun, and now that we got it, if you look in the larger scope of things, there's actually quite a few here. All of them perched on dead trees. And we have two more. One looks like a younger one and then an older one sitting up top. You can see the one at the top. Oh, it's just taken off. Now, in the direction in the direction that that vulture flew now I saw quite a lot of vultures and Angie to to answer your question what vulture species can be found at Ngala the ones here we get five different vulture species which is actually quite a lot and on very rare occasions we do see them all together on large um, dead animals, like say an elephant carcass or a hippo carcass. Um, we have the white-headed vulture, which is one of the more rare ones. And then we also have the um, leopard-faced vulture, which is also more rare in this particular area. And then the rarest one here, because it, out of those vultures, it is the one that nests on cliffs and therefore would come all the way from the Drakensberg nearby. We have the Cape vulture, which is also a very large vulture. And then we have the hooded and the white backed vulture, which is the two that we see here most commonly. All of them, well, hooded and white backed vulture are critically endangered. So we're quite lucky that we see them in large numbers in this particular area. Talking about large numbers, here we have a lilac breasted roller. And even though I've noticed quite a few here and there in certain areas, I have noticed that there are very large numbers of European rollers around at the moment. The European roller, slightly larger bird and slightly more um, aggressive towards other birds than the lilac breasted. I've noticed that the numbers of the lilac breasted, we don't see them as often as we usually do in the dry season. And they seem to be more abundant in the southern part of the reserve. And we are about halfway down in the reserve at this particular point and also um, nearing the southern part of the reserve. So you can see this bird is just looking around while trying to balance himself in this breeze going. It 
Jackson, the color combinations on this bird is awesome. I agree with you. Now, this is a usual hunting technique for this bird. You can see the way it turns its head. It's actually looking for small flying insects in between the grasses. Like the grasshoppers around some praying mantises. Mantids, praying mantids. I'm not even sure I know what the plural is of that. And then, of course, this is also an area that attracts a lot of elephants, and therefore there's a lot of elephant dung, so a lot of beetles move through this area. It's a good spot for this roller to, to be in. I have very keen eyesight, and as it's sitting there, it is looking for movement in the late afternoon sunlight. Some of the areas around here are still covered and highlighted by the last rays of the sun coming from the western side over the mountains. But on the branches that this roll is sitting, you can see there's no leaves on that and it is growing out of a magic quarry. I'm not even sure if it is part of the magic quarry, but what we notice in this particular area is that all over we have quite a few trees without leaves and quite a few um, dead trees as well. I'm talking about elephants and elephant dung moving through this area. You can see all of those trees there, if we look very closely to them, they're all similar in their growth form. And that's because all of these trees are knob thorn trees. Some of them were really large ones. And if we look closely, just look how beautiful the contrast between the shade and the sunlight is in this afternoon. And you can see way in the back, it looks like there's a build up coming from the mountainside. It was a few very, very hot days. Mark, good question. Can all the trees here survive through the winter season in this particular area? A lot of the trees, especially the ones that do drop their leaves in winter time, is very well adapted for surviving through the winter time. The ones around the riverbed, they have access to water, they've got deep root systems, some of them, and they do benefit from um, being close to water, but the other trees are very well adapted for storing their nutrients and also by dropping their leaves, they don't have to exert so much energy, and that way they reserve energy and they make it through the winter time even though because this particular area doesn't get that that cold in very very cold years in extremities you do have some trees smaller trees especially that do suffer from winter time or if it's really really dry like we notice some trees along the riverbed especially fig trees have started dying like we have a fig tree here called the peter's fig and from what they gathered in studies that they've done, they reckon that it's because the water table 2016-17 dropped down so much because of the drought that some of those trees have died only later on as a delayed effect because of the low water table and their roots didn't actually re reach water and the damage was done. But these dead trees over here, this is not because of that. Well, I guess in a way it is. It is also an effect of the dry season or the winter season here. The knob thorns bark is quite high in calcium. And if we look closely at these trees on their stems, we'll notice that the bark's been peeled. Now what happened here 
my guess is that most of these trees are directly affected by elephant activity. Debarked and because of that eventually couldn't transport the nutrients and they died. And that in itself is a knock-on effect of the dry season where there wasn't enough or abundant food for the elephants. But I think we're going to leave this area and continue our search for something else. Maybe some zebra on this part and we'll send you over to Steve for an update. Welcome back everybody. We left our herd of elephant to try and follow up on some noises that we have yet to find. So there was a herd of buffalo on Vuitella Access this afternoon at about 12 o'clock. Which direction they went, I'm not sure, because I went straight north to go and see if we could find the wild dogs that have now been found exactly where they were. So we were very close to finding them, but we just weren't getting any signals, so we moved out. So now we go to Vuitella Access and see if we can find out where these buffalo have gone. Shall we? We heard noises earlier that I thought was a buffalo. Might have been an elephant behaving like a buffalo. That happens from time to time. <laughs> It was very strange noises, but uh, unfortunately with the earpiece in my ear, my directional hearing and always picking up those sounds, not always that good. Hence why we have to have a, a backup with us when we're walking from a safety point of view. Our hearing out here on foot is our most important element. The most important, as we were talking earlier about how do you know if an elephant's not happy with you, you can sometimes hear it. But most other animals you will hear. Heather, there are a couple of poisonous plants. Um, uh, one off the top of my head that I might be able to find shortly. For example, this red bush willow right here. The pods are apparently poisonous if we had to eat them. Now, I've obviously picked the only red bush willow in the world that doesn't have any pods but apparently the pods themselves are poisonous. I haven't tried them. Uh, apparently one of those plants that you try once. The uh, black monkey orange as well, their pods or their fruits when they are not ripe are poisonous and the name strychnos comes from strychnine, which is, I suppose you could kind of relate it to cyanide in a way. It's got a, a sort of a potent poison to it and the strychnos reabsorbs the strychnine when the fruit is ripe. So they want the animals to eat it only when it's orange or reddish orange and then they can eat it and then distribute the seeds. Let's see what else we can find. The only red bush willow in the world without pods. That's called a clutch. What else is poisonous? Um, if we found any candelabras uh, all the euphorbias are poisonous. All the euphorbias, so the tambuatis. We're in an area you should probably find a tambuati, but so the tambuatis are poisonous. The the sap, the bark, so the milky latex. Um, there are some some bulbs and some tubers that are most certainly poisonous. We often find a, um, a naturalized weed in South Africa called uh, moonflower, the chura, which is also regarded as quite highly poisonous. But it's also a plant that South Africans have also named as malpita, and the name malpita means crazy seeds, uh, because if you eat them, they make you go a little bit mad, and too many of them would kill you. So try and avoid that. The, uh, I'm going to find one right now, surely. Not a moonflower, but I'm going to find a poison apple, as the name poison apple would imply. Poisonous. But uh, we have to find one. They make these beautiful little yellow cherry tomato like, like um, fruit. It's not a cherry tomato, it's not to be eaten. Sorry, Hun, sorry about that. What else is poisonous out here? A 
A lot of things are quite bitter, but that doesn't necessarily mean poison. That often means uh, tannin. And tannin is a plant protection that animals will avoid because they can taste it. You can taste tannin in red, in uh, English tea. You taste it in red wine, that tautiness of a, of a young Cabernet Sauvignon. As it gets older, that tannin softens, it gives it a lot more flavor. But a very young Cabernet, get on the palate, that tongue, bitter, that is tannin. And tannin actually binds to protein. So tannin is not easy to digest. It prevents the plant from being broken down. And so animals will taste that and go, ah, I'm going to leave that alone. So those are called alkaloids, also phenols, which are basically plant medicinal properties or pro plant protection properties. And those are things that humans have copped onto with regards to plant medicine. A lot of the plant medicine around the world that is taken in all sorts of ceremony, in the wrong kind of dosages, they could kill you. So it's not something to just go and try willy-nilly. It's something that you need experienced people to assist with, but lots to be learned from plant medicine. Lots of ailments to be cured, mind, body, and soul. Mushrooms, for example, be very careful with mushrooms. Mushrooms, they sound quite fun. Um, and there's a lot of edible mushrooms, but if you don't have a clue, rather just avoid it because uh, most mushrooms are poisonous. Most of them. Ah, see a leaf of a plant. It is not the same leaf. Okay, well, we're just going to drive through this drainage and we're going to see if we can catch up with our buffaloes from this afternoon on Vuitella. Hi, my name is Damon and I'm a guide here at Ambion Pinder Private Game Reserve. Join me and our resident ecologist, Craig Shelter Douglas, at the fireside on the 21st of March for a discussion on two of our conservation projects. In early 2016, Ambion was faced with the fact that without some serious intervention, our rhino population could be in some serious trouble. And so a decision was made to start a rhino dehorning program. Sadly, the fastest mammal on land, the cheetah, is also racing towards extinction. The Ambion Pinda conservation team has been working on a project that aims to increase the genetic integrity of cheetah in protected areas around the country. Sign up to be a wild earth explorer and join us for a lively debate where we'll answer as many of your questions as possible. Wild earth explorer Jamie recently joined Tristan as he broadcasts live from Juma. Awesome to kind of have a guest on board. I'm looking forward to this. This is Jenny. Hi everyone. Hi. <laughs> and Jenny is the first of our Ticket to Dream holders. If you want to go on safari with a wild earth guide, whilst honing your bush knowledge and of course featuring in one of our shows, then head over to our website. Literally being with Tristan on the vehicle today has been incredible. It has truly been a dream come true. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could be making your first ever on-screen appearance. I would highly recommend being a part of the Explorer program and being able to be a part of, of an interactive live drive. Hi, my name is Tristan Dix and I am a guide here at Juma Private Game Reserve for Wild Earth. We love connecting you to the African bush and we always look forward to all of your questions. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, you'll need to register on the website. Once registered, go to our live safari page and submit a question below the live feed. Catch up with me on Wild Earth. <laughs>
All right. Welcome back. Sorry about that. <laughs> Lovely group of giraffe. Yeah, BK says they're all hiding behind the tree. But you can see they actually look a little bit interested in us. It's almost like curiously looking around the tree saying, hmm, what is that? So you can see from the ossicone structure there, this is definitely a male that's hiding behind the tree. And he's also going <laughs> to peer around. Definitely a bull. And then that one on the left now is a female. So this bull is associating himself with this group. Four up to about 25, 30 you can find in these unstable female groups. And like we've spoken before, there's no long-lasting bonds. Temporary association. Oh, now I'm going to take a nibble. Stripping the leaves. So like we were watching the oryx this morning, you can see he hardly even chewed that mouthful properly. Chanting Goshawk just crossed, looked like it just crossed the screen from right to left. Beautiful. And there is a young calf there as well. Can you see the calf there, Abika? Let me just reverse for you folks. There's a, a youngish calf there. Let me just reverse slightly. Catch a little glimpse of this little one. Standing next to mom. Yes, good afternoon. Okay. All right, there it is. Daniel, the ossicones would vary between a male and female. A male will have a very thick, a very sturdy uh, set of ossicones. They'll be dead straight and as well as they'll be bare on top of the ossicones. The female in frame now, you can see how her ossicones are fairly dainty. Uh, they actually bend in to one another and if you take a look very carefully you can still see black tufts of hair presented on top of those ossicones. So the structure is very different between that of male and female in a very easy way and which, what is that you're looking at? You can see how she moved very quickly and she was focusing intently at a spot. She might be looking at those cheetah. Um, those cheetah are just... 80 meters, maybe 90 meters north of their current position. And they've got very good eyesight. Obviously, they've got, they've got height as an advantage. So, if those cats have moved, they would be picked up via these giraffe. And they've got very sharp eyesight. I've... So, look how thin and small those ossicones are. And you can see that tips, there's definitely hair on top there. How do the females need ossicones? So I think it's just presented there via their um, 
their evolutionary time scale. They don't use the ossicones for anything, unlike the males that are very important tools when it comes to male and male competition. Um, yeah, they're just there as a presence, they don't use them for anything. I've seen females just give a little bit of a necking, but they don't engage intensely in the necking behavior such as males do. Obviously that's the way they would one day fight for mating rights to access to a female. Could also be for sex recognition. So from a distance, more than likely an animal could look and they could see, maybe they can judge the structural um, yeah, the structure of them and then actually ID man and female before pursuing and getting closer. <clears throat> Body size would be easily recognized as well. Um, males can definitely recognize other males just due to the sheer mass that males are presented with in comparison to females being very thin and dainty. You can see how they're just locked on there. <laughs> They're very muscular. Take a look at the way the light is shining across that one on the far right shoulder. Look how muscular they are. And, um, I mean, there's a lot of mass on a giraffe. And uh, those big hind legs and large front quarters can get them going. If you look at a giraffe running flat out, it can actually... Its stamina is quite remarkable. It can actually... Um, it's not actually easily outrun by a horse. And when they do run, they can clock at about 50 to about 60 kilometers. <sighs> Ooh, let's send you over to Juma with something stalking. Welcome back, everybody. Well, sometimes fortune favors the bold. We've picked up on our buffalo tracks. And we're about to follow them up towards Sydney's dam and look at what I spotted moving through the long grass. Now it looks like Cara, but I can't really see from where I am. Makes sense because we lost her not far from here this morning. And there's a leopard, everybody, that's all that matters. And uh, just off to my right hand side, there is a group of impala that are in the open. We're not going to be going to them. We're going to just stay with her. Beautiful thing about this long lens camera is we're able to get quite a good view of her from a distance, even if she goes behind that bush. She's going to use this long grass to her advantage. Anne's going to do his best to stay with her. She's actually a little bit more right now. I don't know if you saw that movement, Johan. You got her. Great. She moved quite quickly. Oh, she's trying to figure out her best direction. Look at the leopard crawl. Small group of females scattered around. We're not going to go to them. See if we can stay with our leopard. We're in a prime position to get an enormous amount of the stalk without any interference. It's very difficult to to keep up with leopards when filming them when they're in the thickets. But when they happen to come out into the open like this, makes life a little bit easier for the cameraman. Yeah, no. She's going to be moving forward just behind that bush, so I think if we just wait right here, she's behind that. Buffalo thorn thicket. Hmm. Well, everybody's happy we found our cat. We weren't actually looking for one this afternoon, but, uh, that is what Juma is like, everybody. <laughs> you shake a tree. 
and a leopard falls out. I'm only joking. If you shook it, they wouldn't fall out. They're very good at holding on. Okay, so Johanna's got her again. She, see how she's moved? in that long grass. So Johan's got a good height advantage to me. I managed to spot her with my binoculars. Rex, Rex. Excuse me while I talk on the radio. Thanks, James. James has confirmed it is Cara. Thanks, James Richard. I thought it was, but um, without getting a really good view, it's nice to have our phone a friend, phone of friends at home. Yeah, she's going to pop up again in a few meters. Incredible. That grass is not even up to my knee. Probably shorter. girl well that's exactly the camouflage it's called disruptive camouflage it's designed to break up the outline of the body and it works in thick vegetation and it works also in very sparse vegetation to be honest if she wasn't moving I probably wouldn't have seen her So I'm just going to move up over here and then turn the car so we're facing back in that direction. And parlors have no idea that she's here, but she does have quite a distance to travel. So we'll just be watching from a distance, and while we do that, we'll send you back over to Kyle yes, with his giraffe. Yes, It must be very difficult following a leopard in that environment. So I take my hats off, my hat off. I do have multiple hats, but yeah, I take my one hat off to all the guards in that area because it, uh, without a doubt, it could be very challenging following a leopard through that dense vegetation. We still have our beautiful giraffe. And this one locked on us now. It's starting to cool off quite nicely, which is very nice. And what I'm hoping for is that these giraffe make their way to water. Um, it's really entertaining watching giraffe go down for a drink. See that elongated face, perfectly suited to get in and amongst all the thorny trees, which they would prefer to browse on over here. They are very selective feeders but they're also bulk browsers at that so having a massive impact on the vegetation within the ecosystem be 
Peek ass, but oh, there's another one. <laughs> So a giraffe is a browser, so it's, a, it's feeding behavior is tailored to eating off the bushes, where the mouth will have lots of tiny little hairs, and this would be used as a sensory gauge to feel where the thorns are and where all the juicy leaves are. It's also got a fairly long tongue, and that's also used by males when they're feeding at full stretch to reach up and give them a little bit of extra height to grab foliage. Because if you think about giraffe in Africa, giraffe inhabit also very dry regions of southern Africa. So you go in Namibia, there's trees there that have been browsed, but browsed at a certain point only where they can just, just reach the underside of these trees. And the other, the other animal that would be competing with them is desert elephants that can stand on their hind legs and push themselves up with their trunk. Well, sorry, with their hind legs, but their trunk projecting upwards and reaching for these little piece of life-giving uh, foliages. But, um, yeah, so then, in all in all, they browse, so nibbling and feeding off the bushes. Males tend to feed at a, at a more fuller extension in comparison to the female. Obviously, the height advantage that a male has, he's another meter taller, roughly. So he does have a a band where nobody else is able to feed on, giving him a very exclusive um, area to feed. So it's browsing and a bulk browser at that of this. So eating quite a large amount of vegetation a day. If I can remember, I think it's about 30 odd kilograms a bull could consume a day, which is a lot. 30 to 40 kilograms, give or take. How hungry he is. <laughs> But these ones just taking it easy right now. So all in all, they are really remarkable animals. Just to think about a bull itself, when he is at his mature stage, I mean, his head could be exceeding about seven kilograms, and that's where those osicones, along with the skull structure, would come into important play when fighting for the mating rights of the females. And then if you look at the whole makeup of a giraffe, it is truly remarkable to think about, you know, the blood moving from the heart all the way up to the head. Um, thinking about its blood pressure, for example, it has one of the highest blood pressure out of all animals. So in all in all, they're just really remarkable, all-rounded creatures. There's that long tongue. Elizabeth, the uh, giraffe's most prominent predator here would be lions. And uh, you would need a few lions at that. So uh, maybe two or three females, and then definitely a big male associating um, himself with that hunt. A giraffe is a very dangerous animal to, to bring down. It's, it's fairly sturdy. You need to trip it or set it off balance to bring it down. And once they go for the neck area, it is very, very hard for that animal then to uh, get back up on its feet. But um, yeah, so in other parts of South Africa, lion prides have learned that if they chase giraffe to where the terrain is uneven, that the giraffe will lose its footing. Or what they do is they jump on the hind quarters and they try and set it off balance. And um, and then unfortunately when it comes down, it's, it's tickets. But lions would need to be very careful because the giraffe has got a fairly large hoof. Their hoof length can be anywhere exceeding about 15 centimeters. 
and it's the only hooved ungulate that can kick in all directions. So kicking back just like a horse or like a donkey, but then it can also flick its front hooves out at a predator or a threat in front of it. And uh, if one of those hooves had to connect lion correctly in the, around the skull area, it could be detrimental for the lion. And so um, lions need to be careful and they also learn on how to hunt giraffes. Some of them actually specialize in other parts of Africa hunting giraffe. So these animals are, seems like they're gonna be now moving off into the distance, but let's move you off to Juma where Steve has located something for you. Well, she's decided to just have a bit of a nap in the long grass. And Paula seemed to have moved off a fair bit further. So now she's going to figure out her next step. We are joined by another vehicle in the sighting. If you do hear some noises. Those of you who have ne not met Cara before, we actually had her this morning. We lost her in this general area. It's an area that's quite commonly how uh, home for a lot of Impala. And this is right in the sort of midst of Shadulu's territory. And Shadulu is her mom. Cara is just over two years old. I think she was born around Christmas or so, two years ago. And with leopards, female leopards, when they come of age, will sort of carve out a piece of their mother's territory. Maybe she will uh, take a little bit of Juma and we'll basically be able to see Carla a little bit more. But uh, as with most of the leopards we see in the Sabi Sands, she is not as relaxed as the rest. That's just a vehicle starting. She's not as relaxed because uh, during the whole of lockdown, she wasn't seen by anybody. So she sort of got the term unhabituated from vehicles. So impossible to see her. Can you see her, Jan? Mm Han's -hmm. <laughs> got her. And uh, at the same time, we've got quite a beautiful developing sunset. Nothing wrong with a leopard and a sunset at the same time. them this beautiful sky. I reckon can see her. So we'll just show you this beautiful sky now while we wait for her to wake up a little bit. The thing with leopards stalking in the open areas everybody is as camouflaged as they are they still have a very difficult time of it because these animals are very alert. And there's a reason why they hang out in the open areas is because there's far less brush to obscure the view of the leopard and the lion you find lions are very successful and leopard in thick vegetation, whereas in these open plains, this is the terrain of the fast cats, such as cheetah.
It's the month of March and Wild Earth is offering you the chance to win a brand new prize. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win a five-day eco-training ranger experience for two. Eco-training is a pioneer and leader in safari guide and wildlife training in Africa. The lucky winners can look forward to approaching dangerous game on foot, tracking and 4x4 driving, learning about animal behavior and even spending one night sleeping out under a blanket of stars. In addition, you will also get the exclusive opportunity to join the Wild Earth team on the broadcasting vehicle. Sign up to be an explorer now and it could be you that wins this life-changing experience. Terms and conditions apply. Our lives are dictated by alarm clocks, traffic jams, constant multitasking and countless distractions. The wilderness is where many of us feel the most human. On a bushwalk, we become part of the natural landscape. As you step off the vehicle, everything comes alive. As with any risky experience, walking amongst these animals inspires awe and appreciation. Now, it's your turn to go on a bushwalk. Join us from Pridelands as we slow down our thoughts, put aside our distractions, and reconnect with a place that first taught us how to be human. I'm Nikki here at Ambion Ngala in South Africa. I love getting questions from viewers about all the small things within the environment and how it all is integrated with one another. If you want to ask me any questions, please simply register with the Wild Earth website, head across to the Live Safari page, and then post your questions there. I'm looking forward to chatting to you on my next Wild Earth drive. Welcome back to a beautiful sunset in Juma Private Game Reserve, where we have a leopard somewhere in the grass, but we're not going to go any closer. If she moves, we'll, we'll frame her up, but we're just going to allow you a moment to enjoy what happens every day, every day of our lives about this time. I would love it if you could all send through a little one-word tweet. How does this make you feel? A couple words if it's hard to do it in one. You're also welcome just to sit back and breathe it all in. Thanks, Lydia. 
I'm not going to lie. I enjoy them myself. The hun's become a firm favourite of the years, haven't you, hun? True. Hmm. It's one of those simple things in life, everybody, that I think many of us take for granted. You know, the rising of the sun, setting of the sun is a daily occurrence in our lives. an unstoppable, unchangeable thing. Although the hours change slightly, it's unstoppable. It brings such majesty, such brilliance to the day, to the night, to the morning. Mm. Mm. Nearly ladies, relaxed. I'm happy to hear that. I'm feeling quite relaxed myself. We often find ourselves in a sighting and then we want to leave to go and enjoy the sunset. And sometimes the animals just happen to be there. Those are often my favorite giraffe silhouette in the sunset. That's often very special. That's often very special. I feel truly blessed. Mmm, Beach Bunny feels very grateful. The endless African skies, everybody. I've had many guests in the past from Europe who'd always say to me, the sky is just so big here. And being born and raised in South Africa, I don't, didn't really notice. It's always looked so big to me, but when you come from a city, your sort of perspective of the skies is, is very difficult to see, unless you're constantly on top of a skyscraper. Your perspective of the sky is very limited. So the endless horizons together with the beautiful colours. Daily masterpiece. Mm. Barbara feels introspective. Very good. The only thing to do in these moments is to breathe, enjoy. Amazing how beautiful places and beautiful moments have the ability to calm us, to relax us, to make us think inside of ourselves without overthinking. Think about what we're grateful for. I never find myself sitting at a beautiful sunset, sunset scene, feeling negative, feeling sulky, and uh, with our patience, looking at the sun has paid off. We've got a head, head in the long grass. I made a comment on the radio before that uh, she's lying up in the long, short grass. And one of the people on the radio came back and said, please, Steve, please describe long and short grass. And I said, well, the grass is normally quite long, but now it's quite short but still long enough to hide a leopard, to which he did not reply. So I think my answer was sufficient, don't you think? Yeah, Jan seems to think so. Deep breaths in and out, beautiful moments.
as your view, yeah, and still obscured by the long short grass. <laughs> ah, it's a yawn, so we're going to count down from ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Sometimes it works. What I think she's going to do is wait for the sun to set a bit more, for the darkness to envelop her completely, and then seeing she knows where some food is, she's then going to make a move. Well, the RPs have made some moves this afternoon, and he's caught up with a much larger cat. And we have arrived at the perfect time. Both of them heads up. You can see that one's looking around, looking rather confused and hungry. Nice big yawn. Look at the missing canine at the top left. I thought I saw some darkness or a little dark patch there where the canine used to be. It's possible that this lion is starting to uh, have some sort of an infection, infection there, or maybe it's just starting to rot. But he's got his head up because he heard another lion call. He hasn't had anything to eat yet. You can see that one there. The way he's moving his head. You can hear the noises. Even though you can't see it, he's busy feeding. You might ask why is only this one feeding. You can hear the growls every now and again. It's almost as of his <laughs> premeditating aggression towards his brother. And to his advantage, he is larger as well. And the Impala is a small meal. Mealy, good question. Do male lions rely on the females to hunt for them? Um, I guess you can say yes and no, but uh, generally speaking, no. They can hunt for themselves very well. These two males spend a lot of time together on their own without being part of a pride and moving vast distances without having other members with them when they were younger before they were strong enough and confident enough to take over an area and during that time they had to hunt for themselves so they are quite capable of hunting for themselves however when they reach this age we find that um, they do tend to find it easier relying on the females to hunt for them Females make a kill, they feed the males who are following them or tracking them and then eventually gets to them and chase them off because they're bigger and stronger and then they reap the rewards. You can see, look at that male's eyes is literally closing as he's eating. So he's definitely... Enjoying it. it. Looks like he's chewing something small that he's putting off, maybe a bone or. Yeah, you, know, you can hear the crashing. So, yes, I think it, the answer is yes and no. Because, um. Because um, when they hunt, f when the females hunt for the males, they do find it um, 
easier to get food that way. If I'm not mistaken, name is Cool Dad. Um, oh, how did that lion lose his tooth? So, my guess would be maybe in a fight, maybe a fight around a a carcass, maybe even it was his brother that's chipped his tooth or broke it off. Now, for a moment there, I had a quick listen out. It sounded like I heard some impalas alarming somewhere nearby, not too far from where we were. And I think that might be other lions in the area. This particular impala that these lions are eating, or this lion is eating, mainly this one. And I'm sure it will be done in not too long. We suspect that it might have been killed by a female cheetah. And these two picked up on it, or at least this one, came and chased her off and took it for himself. And being as large as he is, he will probably finish that whole impala on its own. It doesn't look like a very large one. of the carcass. It's amazing to sit and listen to the sounds of this animal eating. doing is because it looked like there's still quite a bit of meat left on the back side and in the belly so this lion's after he had his full earlier today now that it's cooler and he doesn't have to spend so much energy on staying cool he's decided To, um, to start feeding again. But I think I'll sit with them a little while, longer see how the situation develops. And in the meantime, we'll go over to Carl with some cheetahs at Twalu. We've had a slight bit of movement. They have come out from their very dense little spot that they were located at earlier. They're now just tucked up on the western side of this little blackthorn and giving us a bit of a better view than we had earlier. One brother there watching the sunset. So they should get up hopefully very soon and become a little mobile for us. This is when cheetah normally operate in what they refer to as crepuscular. So early morning, late afternoon. And this is a favorable period when prey is also mobile 
busy grazing or browsing, moving to and from water. And that'll be perfect for you then to run in to an available prey species. So he's just looking at the cloud development in the north. Very beautiful. Let's look at the scene that we have got playing out in front of us here. Look at that. So we've got some stretching, we've got some yawning going on. It's normally a sign that they should get up shortly. Uh huh, okay. Will they stay together forever? They are literally touched by the hip. They found a female, I think it was nearly two weeks ago now, and somewhere along the lines they got separated, and the brother that was here around at this pan just behind us did not stop calling. He called through the morning, into the afternoon, and then even into the evening. <clears throat> they are literally attached by the hip. And they will stay together the entire life. So when they break away from mother at about 18, roughly give or take months, they would have broken off together and they would have been together from that very point. So the bond between males is very strong. And if they are separated because of any given reason, they almost don't know what to do with themselves. So I've taken into consideration from day one they have been solid companions finding females bringing down prey defending each other so when they are separated it is a frantic search to try and locate your sibling and they would have tried to locate one another by uttering this sharp almost like bird oh, i can't even explain it <laughs> Um, how protective are siblings with each other? They would definitely defend each other. Um, oh, if it has to be an immediate threat, I've seen wild dogs chase them. It's, it's get out the way, you know, move as quickly as you possibly can. Um, I've never seen a cheetah turn back um, to defend its siblings, so I've never been in a situation where a cheetah's been caught. Um, but I have seen footage of a lion grabbing a cheetah and the sibling's boy made a beeline in the opposite direction. There's no way a cheetah would turn back and try and defend. So it also depends on what the threat is and what they would have to defend against. So if it was something like another cheetah, they would definitely go head to head. But something a little stronger like a lion or a hyena, no. Nah. You've got to look after your own rare India, so to say. Yeah, there's been some incredible footage where lions have caught cheetah, and that's their biggest threat out here. It's lions and hyena. And they fall victim a lot, especially parts of Kruger. If you look at East Africa, they fall victim to large carnivores a lot. I'd like him to get up because then we could see the status of his of his tummy and we could get a better indication if they're going to be going out for dinner this evening because we've got about an hour and a little bit left of good light where they would typically be focusing on. Um, I've seen a lot of hunts also end into that like dusk period. It's also where wild dogs are also very successful as it gets later. Quite remarkable. Is weird. Is what do I think their favourite prey is? Um, yeah. So over here it would be a mixture of oryx, uh, springbok, dacre, um, 
yeah, and when obviously we're going through the lambing period of, of antelopes such as wildebeest and oryx, that would definitely be a focused prey species because then your your success rate almost is 100% on younger species. So they, they're fairly successful hunters. I think it's between a 60 and a 70% success rate. Uh, but as you go to younger prey items, it's almost 90 to 100%. But on Tualu, it's, it's a mixture of oryx, wildebeest, especially for these individuals. Um, and then steer and bok and dake. Kudu as well, especially young kudu. Anything with horns is very dangerous, and animals know that, um, especially cheetah. Um, BK. Directly 12 o'clock on us, on the blackthorn. You can see on the right hand side of the blackthorn there. Uh, down. Yes. Uh, no. Where did you find that one? Uh, to the left, sorry, directly 12 o'clock. Sorry, folks, I want to just jump to another bird here. We haven't seen this one yet. There we go. Yes! Red back shrike. And there it goes. And they don't sit still for long. <laughs> don't sit still for long at all. But really nice to catch a glimpse of that lovely bird. So soon we'll be moving off from Twilight. And we won't get to see them again until we have favourable rains. BK on the birding. I didn't even see that other shrike. Coming really beautiful right now. It's soft and it's just making things glow. You want to get up? Come on. So there's nice black markings behind the ears. Heather, do cheetahs cry? Um, there'd definitely be some type of mourning um, if a cub is killed, but there's actually an old folklore. Africa's full of beautiful stories and tales of, of animals. And they say that a cheetah did cry so long and so hard that uh, the, the tears actually stained the face, and that's where a cheetah got those black tear lines from. Um, but physically cry? No, there'll definitely be some mourning um, and some sorrow. Um, obviously, if one had to find the cubs or the nest empty, she would frantically call and try and locate um, at the individuals. But crying? No. No, no, no crying. <coughs> yeah, we're going to get up soon. So he turned his ear and he listened to me there. His brother, on the other hand, <laughs> yeah, okay, those tummies do look like there's something in those stomachs. So this also could account for why they are being fairly static, because they're busy digesting. To move around with a big belly is extra work. nice beautiful white tip at the end of that cheetah's tail there is nicely displayed in the middle of its body that white tip will also be used when a female has cubs she will actually guide them with that white tip they'll follow that white tip almost as like a follow me sign or signal guiding them through this long grass doesn't feel like so long ago that moritz i think it was moritz that got this young cheetah cub out, cubs out west. To think now that was, sure, coming on close to a year already. Just shy of a year. Hmm. 
eight months, nine months ago. Very compact, small head, and you can see the position of those nostrils, big nostrils, positioned right in front of his head. Obviously, when that animal's running, to streamline the air into the lungs, which obviously fuels the body, those big muscles. So very prominently displayed those lovely eyes. That's a very important um, sensory organ for cheetah. I mean, cheetah use their eyesight predominantly to locate prey. And like birds of prey, they have very, very strong light sensitive cells on their retina, enabling them to see, I think it's up to as far as between four and five kilometers away. And that is a tremendous distance to locate prey. But you can just see the size of them. And like, I think it was your hobby that mentioned earlier, they're very hard cats to photograph because you want the eyes being in play because that draws your audience into the character of the animal. And it's only late afternoon like this when you can really get very good photos of cheetah. So when it comes to being on a photographic safari, light is everything. And also activity. But here you can get creative with your photographs, taking photos of the spots or maybe a part of the ear. I like to get creative with photographs. On the 27th of April, Wild Earth will be turning 14 years old, and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all of you. And to celebrate, we will be finishing the beautiful book that we started last year that looks at the history so far. But we do need you to be part of it. Please submit your most memorable sighting, or what Wild Earth means to you, or even just your name and a comment to be included inside the book. Head over to the website to add your name and reserve your copy. We are offering a 20% discount on all books bought before the end of March. And a big thank you to all of you who have contributed to the book so far. For all of you Wild Earth explorers who bought plaques, today is the day that you will make your very first safari on our vehicle. Because we are quite remote here in the bush, they have taken some time to arrive, but I am happy to say they are here and they look great. Marcel has spent the day attaching them. Let's take a look. Before we mount these nameplates, we just give a light dusting of green paint. This is to better match them to the color of the vehicles and also to decrease the reflectivity of the metal and thereby staying sensitive towards the animals. Bumble crew. Hopefully, Dan Black, Liesel Apgar, and Alicia George. Well, it's time for me to get ready to take you all on a safari. Let's go. My name is Ross, and I'm a field guard at and beyond Pinda Private Game Reserve. I love getting questions from guests on Wild Earth because I love sharing and learning information about nature with new people and it also makes me feel like you're all joining me in real life. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, then you need to register on our website. Once registered, go to our live safari page and submit your question below our live feed. So we, it's getting a little bit darker now and where this lion is, it's quite difficult to see him so we had to switch over to the infrared light. And he's still feeding. 
You can see a lot of flies going and buzzing around his face. He doesn't seem too bothered though. Looks like he's got a good piece of meat now. So there was one brief attempt from the other lion to come slightly closer and see if he might get something, but he doesn't seem to want that meat badly enough. And the risk an injury or even a little bit of a fight between the two. Now, all around us where we are, there are some alarm calls coming from everywhere and I think that the other lions might still be in the area. But the fact that these two don't seem bothered by anything else and this lion couldn't be bothered any less as long as he can eat. Not even all that fluff. Not even all that flies can bother him. I imagine having to eat meat that's been on a hot day like this, an extremely hot day. It's been laying in the grass with lots of flies and flying insects. This area has got a lot of um small seasonal pan systems around and because of that there's a excess amount of flies and insects that breed near or in water and this lion left that impala for quite a few hours yes he's clever enough to drag it into the shade maybe not to leave it out exposed into the straight sun but I think that's also more Rather not to attract other predators through attracting the vultures. You see, it looks like he's got a leg in his mouth there. Looks like soft bones, even chewing it with his incisors or the front teeth. But just imagine having to eat meat like that. It's incredible to think that these animals have the capabilities to tolerate rotten meat like that. Or meat that's slightly off. Or completely off. Sometimes very old. You see him shifting it around from one cheek to the other. Let's try and get it into those sharp cutting teeth. Or the molars, or as we call it, the carnations. And normally with lion, they don't digest the bone. They're able to handle quite rancid meat, but they don't digest the bone or the hooves. And usually afterwards they'll regurgitate and then we'll find it within the, within the signs that they leave behind. But small bones like that from an animal like an impala are soft enough to crunch. So there's a lot of nutritional value in that bone marrow.
It's amazing to see the lengths that these animals will go to to see and get um, get to certain nutritional parts of a carcass, even if it is something as small as an impala. Sounds now like those alarm calls are coming closer, and I'm suspecting that maybe there was a lioness with her two younger ones somewhere in this area, and I suspect that it might be them moving closer towards this side. At least I hope that's the case. That would be very interesting to see how they would react. This male lion, however, I don't think he'll change his behavior at all. He'll probably just continue to finish the impala off on his own. If anything's left over, that might go to the rest. While we wait in anticipation to see if more lions might pitch up here, we'll head back to Twalu, where they still have their cheetahs. I, too, find it absolutely remarkable how hardy and how the stomachs of carnivores are developed to withstand carrion or rotting meat days and days old and they chomp down on it we've just been watching four little scaly feathered weavers make their way in and out of this abandoned white brown sparrow weaver nest you can see there's one still perched up on top of the tree there he sits and i thought maybe that they would actually reside within that nest for this evening. I don't see why not. Um, if it's an available spot and you'll be safe for the evening, it's not to say they will not nest or reside, sorry, inside that nest. But uh, they are definitely very interested, making their way in and out, in and out, almost examining it to see if it's fit for this evening. Um, but the structural uh, aspect of it, you can see it's, it's definitely a white brown sparrow weaver nest. <laughs> It's up and down the beak. <laughs> At first I thought it would just be collecting the finer parts of material left behind. But um, all four of them made their way in the nest. One or two came out. And now they've just been in and around it. There comes one out. And in. There we go. So at night time, you want to be in a safe spot when it comes to being a bird. Because if you are resting and sleeping out on a branch, there's a very good chance that you could be caught. But being in a nice little cozy nest like that, that's cherry on top of the cake for the evening. And you could have a few birds, four or five birds at times, especially through the winter period winter period cramming themselves into these little nests and that's a very efficient way on how they exchange body heat Elizabeth how do weavers defend themselves against snakes so there's not much they can do they kind of just stand by and watch it go on they can communally mob the snake and you know, if the mobbing behavior is so high that it can actually deter a snake. I've seen weavers almost dive bomb um, a snake and using their little claws actually come down and hit the snake. Um, and sometimes the snake actually loses its grip and falls from the nest. So there's not much they can do. Mobbing behavior is the best form of defense in that situation. 
Um, there's also a chance it could get caught. I've seen birds being caught on the wing. A cobra's not a fast striking snake, but I've seen uh, one get lucky strike and actually catch a weaver mid-air. But um, besides that, they just got to sit by and, and hope for the best. Well, that's all they can do. There's no real strong defense, defense that they can, you know, suit up in bring the A game or defense game and I'm going to go inside buddy nice. you can see the light and the color on that nest the sun is setting very fast it's basically touching the horizon <coughs> oh, excuse me sure um, so we are starting to lose light and these cats are still very flat so this little bird is providing us some great entertainment and just shows you with an animal, whatever is it available at that given point, they will try and utilize it. Might it be food, a mate, a nest site, or a resting site? You know, you want to be safe. Okay, and there it's taken off. So definitely not sleeping yet. I think all of them actually have left. But these white brown sparrow weavers are a lot more aggressive. in comparison to the sociable weavers and they are larger as well so a colony like this would would have a better foothold at defending themselves um, against a snake definitely but also that structural component is not as elaborate as the sociable weaver nest you can see a snake can meander on that branch very easily and find its way in that nest with great ease actually to be honest especially something like a boom song which is a borally adapted that means tree adapted ah, yeah, it's come back it's got a piece of material in its mouth in its beak no it hasn't oh it does hmm, there we go making it snug for the evening oh yeah So more than likely the wife said, go and collect more bedding, please. I want to be warm this evening because the temperature during the night now is really starting to get chilly. I'm even under the covers now in the evenings. Hmm, very nice. So you learn something every day. Such a beautiful little bird. All right, well, we've got somebody looking at us on this side, yawning. <laughs> hey guys, stop looking at the birds, look at me. Beautiful. A little bit of grooming, a little bit of yawning. Hmm? These are all good signs. So, like we spoke about earlier, these boys are well into the years. And if that cat yawns, I want you guys to focus on the color of the teeth. You can also see he's got some nice scratches and scars on his face. So, it shows he's gone through the years and he's really, he's really wearing his ears on his body. Um, but in captivity, 12 to 4, 17 years, I've, I've read. Um, but these guys over here in the wild you know average between nine maximum nine years uh, would be the life expectancy all right beautiful well and that beautiful scene let's send you over to Ngala with those lions situation developing here. This line has moved 
whatever few bones and piece of skins left of the impala to a different Majigwari. I think he basically just did it because he was trying to show off and get away from his brother, but his brother's now moved closer and um, that's why we were seeing a little bit of aggression there from this one. It should be interesting to see what happens here because I think this line will definitely finish off what he's feeding on but the other one probably won't want to even though he might finish off the scraps if there are any left I don't think that's why he's in waiting mode he wants to probably move off at this stage situation like this maybe As I can hear bones crunching from where I am which means that this line is definitely on the last part of this carcass Sinek, I know oof, from where we are, we can't have, a, we don't have a clear view of this line, only it's eye every now and again. But that's a very good question. Which predator do I think has the best camouflage? Yo, that is extremely tricky to say. Um, there are so many spiders, snakes, or reptiles in general. Some of them, I'd say, out of the ones that we see regularly here in the low felt and on Angala, yeah, let's say out of the large predators, I'd probably go with leopard. But then again, in towards the end of winter time, when the grass loses all its color, color and it gets quite tawny. And the lion also blends in perfectly. I have seen before an impala standing and literally right in front of the impala in not too tall grass. A lioness was laying more or less a meter and a half away. And the impala was suspecting something, but it didn't see the lioness. And I thought that was incredible to see. You never know. I guess it depends on the conditions, it depends on the area, it depends on where exactly it is and um, what kind of predator it is. I do know that when you're walking you often overlook things such as snakes. Like, take the puff adder, for example. I remember one day, me and one of the trackers were tracking in a riverbed. We were tracking lions and we were looking around and the next thing we realized, like right between our legs, there was a puff adder going through. We didn't even realize it was there. So it's really, really tricky to say. I don't really have a choice. Oh, I, I don't really have a decision on which one I think is the best. So, I think to narrow it down, out of the animals that we see more regularly, like let's say the big cats, I'd probably go with leopard though. Now, it should be interesting to see what these lions do from here because this male is quite full after his meal now where the other one hasn't had much to eat 
so... I don't know exactly what they're going to be up to tonight and if they're going to move far or not. And I guess that remains to be seen until tomorrow. But while this line finishes off his meal, we'll head over to Kyle. We've got nothing this side. Yes, we have just started to move. And look at that little duck out the way here. Beautiful to see this cat mobile. Very graceful walking pattern. And it does so with the greatest of ease. You can see where the front foot is lifted, how the hind foot goes in front of the front foot track and the other brother should be coming through here very soon. Here he comes. Lovely. You can see his belly is quite full. Somewhere along the lines he's had a sneaky meal. Cheeky. You can see his sibling's stomach is not nearly as full. He's actually having a bit of difficulty <laughs> walking. Chill. And test. And this is what we have been waiting for all afternoon. You can see how alert they are scanning left and right. Using those great eyes to pick up on anything. A long tail swaying. Incredible. more than likely going to go have a little sundowner. You can see how those ears rotate, how they independently move. Very important when he's busy looking south like that, how he can listen behind him. Magic man, I couldn't agree with you more. It is very cool to see Cheetah Mobile. Uh, it is a great pleasure watching Cheetah regardless, but watching them move across this beautiful landscape is such a treat. So we're gonna sneak around the corner. Oh, there's the one there. Oh, we might have a bit of marking behavior here. See how the social weaving is. Yes, uh, let's go this way, so we don't bother him. The cat is busy marking and I wonder if we're going to get this cat jumping up into this tree. That would be a sight. Let's just go in here so we don't bother that other boy. Maybe not. He's now walking away so I'm not going to go off-road there. They'll stick on the road right here. Obviously, you don't want to off-road. Wherever you can avoid it, you shoot at all costs. So, oh, guys, some fresh cheetah tracks here. Very nice. Smelling. Remember that scent that they they apply through their territory only lasts a few days. Hmm, smelling something else. As you can see his tummy is not full like his brother. And then if you look at the left there, you're gonna see, wow, look at that. 
beautiful to see. That uh, cat over there is busy marking right now. And he's busy uh, defecating as well. Also very important when it comes to uh, demarcating these territorial boundaries. Hi, my name is Damon and I'm a guide here at Ambion Pinder Private Game Reserve. Join me and our resident ecologist Craig Shelter Douglas at the fireside on the 21st of March for a discussion on two of our conservation projects. In early 2016, Ambion was faced with the fact that without some serious intervention, our rhino population could be in some serious trouble. And so a decision was made to start a rhino dehorning program. Sadly, the fastest mammal on land, the cheetah, is also racing towards extinction. The Ambion Pinda conservation team has been working on a project that aims to increase the genetic integrity of cheetah in protected areas around the country. Sign up to be a wild earth explorer and join us for a lively debate where we'll answer as many of your questions as possible. With a slew of potential dangers lurking, it's essential to be aware of your surroundings whilst walking in the wilderness. 20 yards away from one of the most endangered species. This is a big bull. What a moment, what a close encounter with an Ellie bull. He's just over here now. He's moved completely away. Being on a bushwalk and seeing a leopard I mean, it's ridiculous to be this close to a leopard on foot and for him not to run is absolutely insane. How crazy was that? Look at the gap there. It's just the back of the head of a male lion. He is absolutely unaware that we are here right now. I tell you, seeing lions on foot, is, it, it, it definitely brings out the caveman in you, this little scared human being. My name is Taylor McCurdy and I work for Eco Training. I love hearing from all of the viewers. However, I particularly enjoy those of you who have been watching for a few years. Your questions were just so advanced and they really get me thinking. If you'd like to ask a question on Wild Earth, you need to register on our website. Once you've done that, head to the live safari page and submit your questions below the live feed. Simbambili, everybody, where we've got a hippo in the little one-eyed pan. Quite amazed about. I'm just going to allow you to listen to the sounds of all the frogs. surprising how much depth this little pan has got but then he's probably just sitting with his legs tucked up underneath him
a beautiful evening. Beautiful sounds. Some flashes of lightning in the distance from the south. I think it was raining in Pinda this morning, so there might be some storm in the way here. Check the forecast. Jack, they can travel as far as they need to. It really depends on what the seasonality is providing for them. Obviously, the major water bodies are, are quite full at the moment, so they don't have the necessary sort of shallows that these guys are looking for. Um, but they can also just go a few kilometers and then get tired and want to rest and some, some water is probably going to come out soon. But they've been known to travel up to 60 kilometers in a night, which is a very long way. If you've ever walked 60 kilometers, 20, 30 miles, it's not an easy feat. That's about as extreme as it gets. There's lots of water around at the moment. need to feed. We had a hippo in a very small little puddle at Bufulsuk at one stage. Then he moved off just before we could go live. They obviously need the water to keep their skin hydrated, cool them down. on from my hippo here and we're going to send you back over to Ambiangala with their lines. Finally we got a little bit of a better view of the other brother which by the looks of it if you could Ask yourself the question what a bored lion looks like. There you have it. You can see the glowing eyes. That layer of reflective cells at the back. It's actually quite amazing. In this infrared light, we can actually see scars and the marks on this animal very very clearly and if we look at the eye we can clearly see the two different layers now not too long ago we were sitting here and from where we're sitting on the vehicle, we can't see anything in the darkness. And I was thinking to myself and then asked the question, how oh, it is quite something knowing that there's a lion somewhere in the dark there, looking this way. And it's amazing that we have technology like this that makes us able to see what these animals do after dark without interfering in their world. Now the situation that we have here is not unfair or anything like that. It 
Jerome, that's a real good question. I don't know what it means if an animal's eyes does not glow in infrared light. I guess it's probably a creature not adapted for night vision. Or maybe it's an animal going blind. I don't know, to be honest. It's a really good question. I think it's something that I'll have to have a look at and research. As I was mentioning, it is a, this is a situation that we don't... One might think it seems quite unfair that this particular male lion isn't getting anything of that meal. And yes, they are brothers and they do work together in order to protect this area that they stake as their own territory. But when it comes to food, it is each to his own. At other points, we'll find this lion with something to eat and the other one won't go near. I guess it's just that instinctual self-preservation that these animals have and that's how they survive at the end of the day. And we have some action. This should be interesting. You can see a nice stretch. Let's see. He's getting closer to his brother, but you'll see he won't walk straight there. Like he'll slowly approach. But they're very close to each other. You can see there's the eyes of the other one. might do is I might just reposition slightly and move back a meter or so. And there's two magic quarries right next to each other and a lion under each. And I think if that male that just stood up moves any closer to the other one, we might get to see a little bit of action but then again there's also no guarantee of that well, these things off they'll rather avoid avoid not avoid avoid these um, these situations where there's a potential of hurting each other struggling to get a decent view of these two lines, we'll send you over to Twala where the cheetahs are now out in the open. Yep, out in the open on top of this wall um, of this little pan here on our left hand side and they are just taking it very easy. See the one brother on the right hand side there is definitely scanning into the distance. I think this is more than likely where they would reside for this evening. A lot of double banded sand grass coming into the watering hole now. Hey, that was a ghost. And so more than likely if we had to come here tomorrow morning, these boys should still be here or somewhere fairly close. And utilizing their tracks from this point isn't a very hard assessment or practice. 
said that, falling up on the tracks from here to where they would be found in the early hours of the morning. A bit of wind that's picked up now as well. Sage, so looking at their facial features, um, you know, if you look at cheetah over a period of time, you can start recognizing different individuals by just looking at the features or the structure of the skull. But these boys actually have some prominent scars on their muzzle um, above the eye. And then as well as the one male's actually got, looks like a little wart on the tip of his nose, on the left-hand side of his nose, so you can easily recognize um, these two individuals from each other. Sometimes it can be a little bit difficult, but you, you really need to have the luxury of spending an extended period of time, here comes all the sand grass, um, looking at these cats to really start recognizing um, defining features and obviously identifying and separating them. Just making a careful glance every now and then around the pan because this is the period where we'll have a brown hyena come in here or a spotty or even a leopard um, which would be such a treat. <clears throat> so this individual's eyes, if you look at his eyes, they, I find his eyes are quite deeply set. And he's got like very dark appearance around the eye sockets in comparison to his brother, which would have a bit more softer features. You can also sometimes find uh, nicks or cuts in the ear. <clears throat> but he's got a very distinctive face. Look at his face and then... BK is going to show us, sorry BK, um, the brother, when he does look at us, you can, you'll see a striking difference between these two males. Yo, Egyptian geese coming to the water, making a lot of noise. They're landing a lot of sand grass coming down to the water now. And these double banded sand grass would be only once you know, the, her, the sun is on the horizon or set that these birds will come in for a late drink. Can you hear them calling? <whistles> Safety on the water, that's why they're in the water now. You're a lot safer in the middle of a pan than being on the water's edge. White mane are coalitions mainly consisting of brothers. Yeah, there is a definite, there is a def, very definite, strong bond of brothers being siblings when they move off. That uh, it does mainly consist of of siblings from the same litter. It isn't uncommon, and it does happen where other males, nomadic males, will actually join up. Uh, where there are un unrelated individuals join up and actually um, deal the mosquitoes. Shoes. Um, where a nomadic male joins up with um, a current band of brothers which are uh, related. So um, mainly, yes, but not always the case. You can have the instance where other males join up and they're actually not related at all. It's just you in a better position at defending oneself, finding mates, defending territories, bringing down larger prey um, than if you were by yourself. You can hear a lot of mosquitoes. Yo. Good thing they don't like my blood. <laughs> uh, 
Alrighty, from these lazy cats, let's send you to Steve for a quick update. Well, welcome back, everybody. You can just see in the road, there are a huge amount of tracks. I don't know if you can see it, it's very obvious. And there are swarms of flies just hitting us in the face. We've found the tracks of the buffalo. So they must have done a big loop from where they were and then actually headed in this direction and threw us off. Finding a leopard slowed down our progress of tracking them. But we did a big loop and we have cut their spoor. So we're going to follow. Obviously it's not the best viewing of buffalo in the dark, but it's actually quite a nice thing to park in amongst a herd of buffalo and listen to them push and shove and the noises that they make. Very fresh dung in the road. We won't be viewing them with lights if we do find them. Viewing them with the IR, but it was something I used to quite enjoy doing with guests, parking in amongst them and uh, having them just move around the car. LT, I, I love spending time with elephants. Elephants are always busy. Uh, don't get me wrong, I don't mind spending time with leopards at all. Um, but elephants are always busy. They've always got something to do. Um, there's something very majestic about them, something very humbling. Obviously, I will never detract from the experiences I've had with leopards here in the Sabi Sands. But, for example, in um, Pridelands, I saw one leopard and uh, it was a very fleeting glimpse. So, Sabi Sands is a very unique place. A very unique place in regards to the leopard viewing. But the elephants, wherever you go, I love to read their behavior and to spend time with them. It's a very magical and heartfelt. Here they are. There they are. Oh no, those are impala. I just saw the eyes shining. A very magical and heartfelt experience spending time with elephants wherever it is you happen to go. So they're doing a big loop. They came in and they're heading straight back sort of south and west again. They're probably gonna pop out Arethusa side or we might bump into them. But moving in the road like this is a good indication that they're probably heading directly towards water. At the very difficult talking right now with the flies are just bouncing off my face. <laughs> <laughs> and we know where the flies have been, don't we, Johan? They've been right there on that poo and that poo and that poo right there. Try as hard as I can to avoid driving over the poo, of course. But uh, sometimes when it's in the road like this, it's very difficult. I need a, I need a, a hat with some corks on it keep the flies at bay or just talk like a ventriloquist he doesn't need to open his mouth okay well there's a good chance we might bump into them now but the direction that they oopsie the direction that they're going a very good indication that they've gone straight oh, straight back to Arethusa side but let's have a look and see is what we normally find following big herds of buffalo is a big lions and well the RP doesn't need buffalo to find his. Um Steve to answer your question as to which animal I enjoy spending time with it's, it's i'd say it's the lion um i would have it would have been very exciting to see some buffaloes in this area at the moment it's actually quite interesting we haven't had a lot of buffalo activity on gala in a while and this area used to be known for large herds of buffalo but I do know that with the changing of the season at the moment, I can, we've already start seeing signs of a very large herd, maybe 200 to 300 starting to come in from our northeastern corner. And like that, there's also 
a herd of similar amount coming in from the east and then one in the far west. But at this stage, they're just coming in and then moving back to the surrounding areas. But I'm sure once it starts getting drier, the animals will make their way this way. But what we have here now, so the other brother of out of these two has just gone he's left his parts and then this male stood up and he's busy cleaning off whatever's left I don't know exactly where the other one went. <coughs> but I sure know that even though this one is, it looks like he is making short work of what there was left there, and he might even be licking the ground where the carcass or what was left of the carcass was laying. see is that dark mane rising up from just behind the shoulders but since it's so dark and the lion is disappearing in the darkness oof, it's just gotten up I think he might just reposition go well that's good for us well while we see if we can get another view of these lines we'll send you over to Twala with some beautiful silhouettes well a very beautiful scene we have got playing out over here in front of the vehicle, BK just said, oh my word, and I thought it was an animal very close by to the vehicle. And I saw when he framed up, I looked at the monitor and I was like, oh my word. <laughs> but really beautiful sunset to the western sections. And just a little moment for you guys to reflect. An amazing day that we have had. What a beautiful moment. David BK has really pulled one out the bag for us this evening. And that is just a typical bush Africa scene, you know, if you're typically in the bush and you think about being in Africa in the bush, that is a scene that, you know, would suddenly pop into mind. Just the colors and the trees, the silhouette of the trees, just, it is perfect. So 
heard you guys talking about spending time with animals. I would have to say, I'd have to agree with Steve. I think my favorite animal to spend the most amount of time with in the bush would definitely, hands down, have to be an elephant. They are just so complex and always mobile, always busy. But then there's moments just where they do just take it easy and almost tune out. And I find them almost as complex as humans in their arrangement and the inner workings of herds. It's spectacular. So I'd have to say, hands down, elephants. I'm absolutely delighted to have won the February prize draw for three nights for six people at the Juma Private Game Reserve. I absolutely love everything Wild Earth has to offer. I find the guides extremely knowledgeable and will go above and beyond to ensure a great safari experience. I will be taking my husband and family from the UK to experience this once in a lifetime opportunity. One of the main reasons I joined the Wild Earth Explorer program was for the fireside chats and also to win an incredible prize, which I am so fortunate to win and incredibly happy. I would like to thank Wild Earth for this amazing prize and cannot wait to meet the team. Wild Earth Explorer Jenny recently joined Tristan as he broadcasts live from Juma. Awesome to kind of have a guest on board. I'm looking forward to this. This is Jenny. Hi everyone. <laughs> and Jenny is the first of our Ticket to Dream holders. If you want to go on safari with a Wild Earth guide whilst honing your bush knowledge and of course featuring in one of our shows, then head over to our website. Literally being with Tristan on the vehicle today has been incredible. It has truly been a dream come true. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could be making your first ever on-screen appearance. I would highly recommend being a part of the Explorer program and being able to be a part of, of an interactive live drive. I love being a cam up for Wild Earth. The animals coming right up close to you, especially like lions. Sometimes you get nervous, but you have to go with the flow. <laughs> My favorite animal to film is the elephant because of how big it is. But when it's really up close to you, it's one animal that you would say, I really respect you. So we've left those two lions where actually they've stood up and they've moved off and we completely lost them. It's amazing how they just disappear like that. Um, it was literally the last piece of crunching the bones and then disappeared. But we're about to cross the Timbavati riverbed and at night time this is always very exciting because near the riverbed is where you see a lot of the smaller nocturnal predators. One of those being the genet. And it is a very, very interesting little predator. They actually very efficient predators and they hunt quite large prey.
One of my favorite things at night time is to move or drive through the riverbed. All the sounds, the frogs, birds going. It's often a good spot to find animals, especially after a hot day. Welcome back to the darkness of Juma, everybody. We're hoping for that last minute leopard. Oh, a genet or a honey badger would be nice. Haven't seen a honey badger in ages now. I actually did, I saw one of my last time here, but just saw a fleeting glimpse of it and then saw the tracks, which I was able to confirm. Lovely afternoon out. We had a beautiful leopard. Gorgeous young two year old cat. And some wonderful elephants. HH, there's a whole list actually. Um, owls, many owls, leopards, lions, uh, genet civets. Caracal is more of a diurnal. I have never seen one. Uh, we saw some servals last year on Juma. Did I say Janet? Uh, Whitetail, mongoose, hyena, hippo hippopotamuses. Elephants are diurnal, but they've got nowhere to go. And uh, a lot of these animals are out and about at night, so we don't shine on them. We try and keep our spotlights quite limited. I'm sure I'm missing a few. A pretty much general uh, nocturnal bushveld game. Wild duff, the, mainly the predators are nocturnal. Bush babies, night jars. And well, lots of insects, <laughs> mosquitoes. We're not really looking for them, but they just have a habit of finding us. Well, everybody, we hope you've enjoyed this afternoon's Bumble, this afternoon's game drive. It's been action-packed with all sorts of critters from all, all and abroad. Twalu providing some wonderful scenes as well as Ngala. And we do thank you for joining us. We'll be live with you again tomorrow morning, same time, same place, from as many locations as we're able. And uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you for your questions and comments. Have a good night. See you tomorrow. Goodbye. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, welcome on board and a very good morning to everybody. Welcome to Tswali Kalahari. It is a super dramatic morning here at Tswali.